Good afternoon, evening. How are you doing? Good. How are you going? Yeah, good. Thanks. Good. Excellent. It's um, what was it? It's early for you there, isn't it? Uh, Nine a.m. Yeah, yeah. So this is. It's yeah. not the earliest of drunk whiskey in the morning, but it's up there. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Very good. It's good. To, good to have you on. <laughs> you start to panic after um, you know when your when your presenter's not on yet. You're like, what am I going to say? <laughs> The first thing I read, did you guys time zones change recently? Like, have you gone through, did you the time go back? Just, it's just the, uh, well, not recently, no. Nah. It was the like, last time was the, uh, it was a uh, uh, daylight savings sort of stuff. But yeah, that's yeah. all. Yeah. But um, I think Queensland's different still to Melbourne because they don't do daylight savings up there. So pretty sure. Yeah. So whenever I checked it before, don't worry, not, not this morning, but um, a while back, it said there was a 10 hour difference. And then... Good old Google, and then I was like, I'm pretty sure it's 11, so I kind of Googled it and yeah, I managed to. Managed to find there's it. all good there's only a slight difference between Queensland time and New South Wales, Victoria. They're they're 10 years behind us. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good. And uh, how's the weather down there? Make me jealous because it's not great here. <laughs> well, Rob was just telling us it's beautiful and they're steamy in Brisbane, so. They'll they'll be having really hot, humid weather. I imagine at the moment. Yeah, uh, I don't know. What, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And in Melbourne's, I don't know, summer's day in Scotland. Uh, it's been quite cool, cool here. Lows of seventeen, highs of twenty two today, twenty three. So it wasn't all that warm okay. uh, for for our summer. It's been quite a. Uh, it's not been that warm a summer here, but but a few nice days. So it's been you been know bad. And then, yeah, yeah, I, think, cold. I, think, I think in Melbourne we're all just glad to get out, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> We had a cold day here yesterday in Brisbane. It was minimum 24 degrees. Yep. <laughs> I had to put the jumper on, put the dinner yep. on the on the bed. Yeah, I think it was seven here yesterday. It's a bit warmer today. I think it's closer to 10, but that's uh, that's t-shirt weather in Scotland. But um, yeah. <laughs> that's all right. Where are you at the moment then? Um, so I live in Stirling, um, so Bridge of Allen, um, so kind of central. All the rain and a little bit of the sun. But um, but yeah, I, I, I usually spend a lot of my time traveling. Like a lot of my job uh, takes me to, to warmer places. Um, but obviously, that the last time I traveled was in March uh, last year. So yeah, it's been yeah. been enjoying the joys of uh, of Scottish summers and Scottish winters. But hey ho, <laughs> that's it. It's just just uh, yeah, just a bit depressing with the weather. That's but, right. Yeah, that's definitely. Yeah, <laughs> there's. <laughs> The, um, what was it? I, I got, my auntie lives in uh, Livingston, and she sent me what was probably half a meter of snow one morning that she woke up to. So it's been extremely cold and snowy over there. Um, yeah. So, yeah. But yeah. I mean, the snow's all right to begin with. I, unfortunately, I feel like I've kind of reached the age that I can't enjoy it unless I have kids, and I haven't got kids because there's like yeah. an awesome snow here that everybody's kind of sledging on, and I'm like, I'd like to go on there, but I think that I'd be judged. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> just standing in the house with your gloves and all that on ready to go and yeah. <laughs> snowball like, fighting and yeah it's good yeah uh, yeah so this is where i'm originally from is, is east coast so they don't really get much snow so yeah so i've like scattered out areas that i've ever do have children that's where i'm taking them mainly for my own benefit but yeah um, <laughs> that's right but yeah <laughs> That's good. I actually miss the snow a little bit. It's good. Yeah. I'm actually waiting for somebody like Glenn Fiddick or Glenn Livett or somebody to come out again and say that their warehouse roof has collapsed and they've got to mix 30, 40 year old whiskies together to make another limited edition. <laughs> Some marketing stunt to come out of this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not bad mouthing grants because they make some amazing stuff, but I noticed recently that they put up a thing being like, just so you know, we never actually kind of mixed the casks. It was based on a, a concept because I worked in Whiskey Retail back then. I sold shitloads of Sophie Nix. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, so it's based on the concept of mixing it, but actually it's not actually mixed old stock. And I was like, oh, right. I was very much of the belief that that was what happened. Um, but but yeah, it was like a recent thing. Like, oh, by the way, that wasn't what happened. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that was your marketing for it. But anyway, <laughs> That's right. yeah, yeah, it was, and it wasn't until recently that I found out myself. It was yeah, it was just a basically a marketing stunt, and yeah, good marketing yeah. stunt. <laughs> it's just, I think that bottle went from 160 dollars a bottle up to 1,200 bottles, and the dollars yeah. a bottle in two two or three years or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I made a nice bit of money on it when I was younger, but um, hmm. yeah. <laughs> 
it's, it's almost like the share market with whiskey at the moment, I think. <laughs> That's the thing. The, the golden age of investing in whiskey was five, ten years ago, uh, and I wish that I had more money to throw at it when I did. So I, I used to run like an investment club. I, I worked for a high-end retailer here in Scotland, yep. um, like a whiskey investment group. So lots of people would come to me. I'd, I'd like research the market and new releases yeah. and, and kind of advise what I think was worth buying into. And the annoying thing was this was also people who could afford to do it, and I've made them some serious money. Um, I don't keep in touch with them anymore, unfortunately, because I had to kind of hand over my black book. But um, but if I'd just taken out a loan at the time to throw at some of these things that I was telling other people to buy, I could have done really well. <laughs> um, instead, I just helped other people do well. But um, yeah, nowadays it's harder to make serious money on whiskey in terms of investment. There's still the odd bottle, but um, yeah. Yeah, prices yeah, I... seem to be going up everywhere. Like um, you know, we, we we see it in single casks everywhere. I think there's another increase on the first of March, around about thirty percent. So yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, we're sort of seeing here uh, just your everyday bottlings from distilleries will probably start to go up here around six to eight percent over the next yeah. two months. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah, the whiskey's definitely going up in price at the moment. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Is that tax related then? Like, is it import duties and you guys? Well, I know that there's obviously a, a couple of percentage price increase yeah. here every year. They they froze the import duty last year, but this year they've. Um, uh, put it up by about a dollar a litre so it's not that much really it's more the importing it used to take us around two months to import it's now taken up to four months to import so those interest costs and costs of um docks etc wherever it goes there's increased cost there for delays and you know ships and containers sitting on docks etc and then the price in scotland's obviously uh, we've increased it as well for some products so yeah just an amalgamation of that cost and yeah, so I've not seen it in the shelves yet. It's, a few products have. I noticed say uh, Balvini's product uh, that's gone up quite considerably over here. So, yeah, that's that. Yeah. See with the new editions, and I mean, I take a Japanese whiskey is quite big in Australia as well, just as it is yeah. everywhere. Yeah. The new, the new passing of regulation in Japanese whiskey. I wonder how that will affect the price because Japanese whiskey is obviously skyrocketed anyway. But with the new kind of SWA like regulations, which I think is a good thing, but I, I think that the knock-on effect of pricing on that will be interesting to see yeah. um, whether that pushes it up further or whether they kind of cap it at that and, and just use it as a way to kind of bolster their yeah. um, their kind of uh, provenance. I don't really know. but True, yeah, yeah. yeah. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for um, Angus Dundee to hassle Nika and buy the Ben Nevis distillery now because they've got no need for it. <laughs> no need for it whatsoever. Go buy it. <laughs> To be honest, so Ben Nevis, as, as someone who uses the spirit quite a lot in various things, I'm not a huge fan of Ben Nevis, to be totally honest, yeah, but yeah. That's, that's a personal thing, of course. Um, but they are quite different to any spirits that we own. So to be fair, um, kind of Tom and Tal's very kind of light and, and, and kind of soft and kind of classic space idea, and Glen Caddam's very fruit driven. So Ben Nevis is more of a kind of meaty, sulfury kind of style. So that kind of is a different flavor profile to throw into the bunch, but I don't know if there's anything going on. But, but yeah, you're right, they probably don't need it anymore. <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah, good, good one to put in your portfolio. Then very different. <laughs> we've got about we've got 20, 20 people come in. We're actually expecting forty. There's forty people bought the class, so hopefully uh, they've realised it's tonight and they come in at some stage. So you may get some people joining in. Uh, but thanks everybody for joining. It's really, really good. Great outturn for this uh, this tasting. Everybody's very interested. Uh, a distillery that I really think we really don't know much about in Australia yet, uh, and we want to really do a lot of work on letting people know about the Glen Caram distillery. Uh, I mean, it was only three years ago my wife and I went to the small town of Brecon, uh, and uh, we went there to obviously we had an appointment there uh, to to explore the distillery. And when we got there, we didn't know where the distillery was. We were really struggling. We were on the phone to somebody at reception. And uh, they were trying to direct us there and we just didn't know. So we pulled up at a bus stop and said to somebody at a bus stop, are you local? Yeah, yeah, I just live around the corner. Where's the distillery? Uh, what distillery? There's <laughs> a distillery here somewhere. Now, went to the paper shop. That nah, knew nothing about it. <laughs> so kept, kept going, eventually found a distillery, but nobody in the town seemed to know it was there. <laughs> so, because it doesn't have a visitor center. So that's probably why is that, don't get many visitors going to it and asking, but uh, but that was it. It was like I think now that we're getting to that point where we're tasting more Glen Caddam, we're drinking more Glen Caddam, we're seeing it on the shelves more, and now it's like, wow, we've got to learn more about this because the distillery has obviously been there for a while. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely a well kept secret. I think that, um, 
in in whiskey terms, the industry knows Nancadam because the industry's traded with it for for centuries, and it's it's kind of a key component in lots of premium blended whiskeys as well that you'll find around. Not not even from us, but from people wanting to use that spirit. Mm. Um, but yeah, but Brecon doesn't really embrace it. Um, neither, I mean, I'm, I'm from originally from Carnoustie, which is not that far away from Brecon, and I didn't know there was a distillery in Brecon until I was in the 20s. Um, so it's, it's things that, yeah, it's not the easiest thing to find, and it's very much a production distillery, so it's not not a touristy kind of place to go. And as you'll know, it's kind of wedged in between a graveyard and a football pitch. Um, but it, it's been there for longer than most of those spaces, but it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of stuck in the corner of the town. Um, and yeah, yeah, kind of hidden back <laughs> Yeah, but it's this, is, this isn't a big town we're talking about here either. It's a tiny, <laughs> tiny little town. Um, so um, I everybody should have their tasting packs there. They've got six whiskies tonight. I'll let you take us through the whiskies the way you see fit. Uh, there is a tasting mat, um, and uh, yeah, like uh, like I've said to you before, I'd love to hear a little bit about you as well, as well as the distillery myself. But ch the chat will be on. I'll try and take some questions through the chat from every from everybody, and. Uh, yeah, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. And at the end, you'll get a chance to ask some questions as well. We'll try and facilitate our questions at the end. So I'll pass everybody over to Ian. And uh, yeah, off you go, Ian. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, guys, nice to meet everybody. I hope you're keeping well. Uh, nice to see some, uh, some smiling faces. And obviously, time difference. I'm not going to be swallowing these today, I'm afraid. I've got to drive after this, but I will taste them with you. Um, but please get stuck in. Six drams is a great way to do it. Um, as much as I'd like to start this early in the morning, I feel my productivity might dip. Uh, but um, but it's, it's a pleasure to be tasting with you guys. I'd love to be doing it, obviously, in person, and maybe we'll get a chance to do that at some point. Um, but as Craig kind of said as well, any questions at all, this is kind of nice size of group. So please um, fire in questions, unmute yourself if you want to kind of have a chat. Um, kind of, I'm here to have a whiskey discussion, not necessarily a lecture. So um, I hope we can share some nice drams and, and kind of show you a distillery you might not be familiar with. Um, so as uh, so my, my role with the company, I work for a company called Angus Dundee Distillers. Um, they're a family-owned, independent distilling company based in Scotland, and we own two distilleries. So we own Tom and Tell up in Speyside, and we also own Glen Caddam, which is in the Highlands, which is obviously where we're focusing today. Um, but the company themselves have been making whiskey for almost 70 years. Uh, it's headed up by a gentleman called Terry Hillman. And Terry, still with us, is in his late 80s, but he's very much a kind of um, a kind of encyclopedia of whiskey. Uh, he has been through the tough times and the good times in whiskey and really kind of knows what he's doing. And for me, it's, it's a great guy to learn from. Uh, as you can tell from my surname, I'm not one of the family, um, but they do look after me pretty well. Um, but my role within the company is the global brand ambassador. So I look after their markets around the world, which is a terrible job, but you know, someone's got to do it. Um, but I've actually recently just been appointed as their master blender as well. So I am now in charge of the liquids that you're going to come and see coming out over the next few years, which Massive honour for me, um, but I've, I've always geeked out in whiskey. I've been involved in the kind of blending scene with the company for the last kind of four years, and I've kind of taken that step up. So if you see some fantastic casts coming out, it was me. If you see some really bad stuff coming out, it was probably somebody else. So, so don't worry about that. But <laughs> um, but I do I do have no life. I literally, I geek out of whiskey. I love all things scotch. And as we kind of mentioned at the beginning, just talking about whiskey, I'm also not one of these random masters that reads off a sheet and pretends that nothing else exists. I, I love Scotch for being Scotch. I love lots of different distilleries. I'm fortunate to work for two that I really, really like, but that doesn't mean that my whiskey cabinet only has Tom and Tal and Glen Cadam in it. So kind of, obviously Craig is your resident Scotsman, um, but any questions related to the industry as well that I can help with while I'm here, do fire away. I'll try my best to answer them for you. Um, can I have a quick show of hands? Firstly, has anyone here been to Scotland? I know that I can't see everyone, but anyone here been to Scotland before? Been to a distillery? Has yeah. anyone been to Adam Distillery? Oh, cool. Nice. That's great to see. Um, and for those of you that haven't been, has anyone tasted Glen Caddam before? You're familiar with our whiskey? Yes. Awesome. Nice. Nice. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of, as Craig mentioned, we're not kind of that well known in the whiskey industry. Glen Caddam, I always say, we're kind of known by people who love us. But it's just the case of getting people to, to kind of discover it. Glen Canham is a, is a well appreciated and well loved whiskey. It's just a little bit harder to find. Um, David, that is a good way to do a year. Yeah, 16 distilleries. Nice. I like it. <laughs> so I just put it up in the chat. Um, it's, yeah, so Glen Canham as a distillery is, is something that's kind of existed for a very long time, but it's a little bit harder to find. Uh, and I'm sure that counts even more so in Australia. So I do appreciate Craig kind of bringing it through and you getting the opportunity to try so many of these drams as well. Um, it's a, a distillery that's been there for a long time as, as we kind of talked about and it's 
it's kind of kept itself going um, through its reputation for its spirit. Um, it was built in 1825. Um, and what's significant about that kind of age is that, as you probably know, there's a few other distilleries of that era. And in 1824, that's when whiskey on a mass scale started to become a real industry in Scotland. There was legislation passed and kind of legal distilling, I suppose, became more of an art and bigger distilleries started to open. And distilleries from 1824, you may recognize our names like Ben Livett, McAllen, these sort of things. And we popped up at the same sort of time as them, but the difference between us and McAllen or the difference between us and Van Livett is that they are super giants of the whiskey world. They've expanded massively over time. I think Glen Livett's production just now is about 24 million litres, I think. Um, whereas Glen Caddam has just two stills. We produce 1.1 million litres in a year. Um, so although we've never expanded, we've also never collapsed. We've never been demolished or kind of turned into flats as other distilleries have done over time. And we've kind of survived the thick and the thin, which has been quite nice. Um, so there's obviously something in Glen Caddam that keeps it going. People want to use their spirit. And it makes quite a distinctive style of, of Highland whiskey. Um, I should probably pause at this very moment and say, don't worry, my plan isn't to tell you a lovely touristy tale about Scotland and kind of all the, all the kind of fairy stuff of, of the whiskey industry. That's not really what I'm here to do. I'd rather tell you why it tastes good than tell you all about the water and why it's soft. So I'm sorry if you wanted that stuff. <laughs> um, but the Glen Caddam itself is a really fruity spirit. Um, it's a kind of old school style of East Highland whiskey as well. So the East Highlands of Scotland used to be home to quite a few different distilleries back in the past. Everyone knows of Speyside now, which is kind of the northeast, but actually before Speyside really became what it is, the kind of East Highland region was quite significant as well. And the reason for that is the east coast of Scotland is where all the kind of barley is grown in Scotland. It's, it's where the sun shines occasionally. Um, and with that, um, distilleries sprung up on the doorstep before we had kind of mass transportation and things. It's easier to have something near source. So Angus, as a kind of farming area, was home to quite a few distilleries. Um, but unfortunately, as the industry has kind of peaked and troughed over time, uh, we are the last kind of remaining historic distillery there. Um, they used to be home of your interior whiskey collection. Um, the big distillery from Angus was Lockside. If anyone's heard of Lockside before? Uh, it used to be built, it was in Montrose, but it was a real kind of super giant of the whiskey world of its time. That's all I'm going to fart on about, about the kind of history side, but it is quite a significant old area, but it's not anymore. And the whiskies from the East Highlands of Scotland were known for fruity spirits with a spicy backbone. And that was kind of what they were known to do. And whereas nowadays the Highland category has kind of become a bit dissipated and people make more of a modern style of Highland because that's what sells, uh, Glen Caddam kind of sticks to like an old school style. And our whiskies you'll find will be very fruit forward, but with that kind of inherent spiciness that is, is very true to its area and place. Before I say anything else, I think we should kind of warm the palate with a dram. Um, and I think that, to be honest, the, the best whiskey we can try just now to really give you an idea of that kind of DNA of our distilleries, like Caddam 10 year old. It's a perfect kind of aperitif uh, and a nice kind of stepping stone into the range. I take it you guys have, your mats will tell you what you've got in front of you, right? They're not numbered, just checking. They're not numbered, <laughs> no, they've got, yeah, they've got on it. Perfect, okay, I've done this before. I'm like, right, we'll jump to this. I'm like, what number is that? <laughs> Just making sure. Um, so yeah, so we'll start with Glen Callum 10. Now I know that we have a few of us here, but if you do have, um, can I, please do let me know your tasting notes. It's kind of hard to get everyone to run through, but um, one of the interesting things about being a blender and, and being into, into whiskey is that obviously I have my palate and I know what my palate tells me, um, but kind of everyone's noses and everyone's tongues and palates are, are different. It's great to hear what other people taste. So I'll kind of tell you what I get, but at the same time, please let me know what sort of things you pick up um, when you're trying these. There's no right and wrong answers. Don't worry, I'm not going to laugh or belittle you uh, if I don't agree with your tasting notes, um, because everyone's tasting notes are very personal. Um, but it's always great for me to kind of hear it from a, a kind of fresh, um, fresh kind of nose, so from someone else's kind of perspective of tasting as well. Um, something you'll notice about Glen Caddam, um, and it's, I don't know if it's on the mats, but it's definitely in the bottles. Everything that we do in our range um, with the exception to Origin, which is our entry level, uh, every other Glen Caddam you'll ever see will be non chill filtered and natural colour. So everything is bottled at 46% ABV. Um, and the colours you'll see in the bottles are representative of the cast it came from. There's no caramel colouring added um, to these products. And what you'll probably notice with the 10 year old, if you can't see it in your glass, is it's a very, very pale whiskey. Um, it's 100% bourbon cast matured. It uses a lot of first fill bourbon barrels. So that's actually quite a dark colour. Um, from a 10 year old in bourbon casks um, but it's, it's kind of representative of that style because we're not a big distillery we try to kind of push forward more of that 
kind of traditional spirit um, uh, with no kind of um, removal of, of kind of fatty acids and things through chill filtration. So it's a, a kind of fuller bodied spirit, but that's going to enhance that kind of spiciness you're getting too. So the only tip, I'm not going to Jim Murray you guys, I'm not going to tell you how you should taste whiskey, um, but the only tip I will share with you, you may not have heard it before, or you may have, it's something that I use a lot. And when you're smelling your whiskey, uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to pick all the people who have the cameras on here. When you're smelling your whiskey for the first time, how do you smell it? Show me how you sniff a whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So I said the, only, the tip I'm going to give you, and I saw a couple of you doing it already, is that when you're nosing spirit, it doesn't have to be whiskey, but tequila, vodka, kind of cognacs, you name it. Um, if you're nosing a spirit, especially a higher proof spirit, when you're nosing it, try and do it with your mouth slightly open and try and breathe in over the back of your tongue. Sounds weird, but it really works. And you can actually test this. If you do it once with your mouth closed and you give it a sniff and then once with your mouth slightly open, you'll find you pick up more kind of floral notes and more of the kind of delicate notes that you sometimes see in tasting notes that can sometimes be passed over. And the reason for that is that your nose and your tongue obviously communicate flavor and your nose is extremely receptive. But when you kind of connect the two, it kind of, it helps you pick up more subtle notes. And this is especially useful if you're trying something like a cast strength whiskey, because sometimes the alcohol really kind of overpowers everything else. Um, but if you try just that, that technique, um, it does help you pick up a few subtleties. You don't have to keep that, it's okay. It's just a, a suggestion. I was taught this about five years ago and I've never looked back, but it's, it's kind of useful for picking up more subtle notes in a whiskey. That said, you don't need to do this because um, that means you're nuts. Um, and don't do it in a bar because people will wonder what the hell you're doing. But it goes just a little bit over the back of the tongue. Um, and if you try that way, you'll pick up more kind of subtle notes in your whiskey, or you should do, but it's just a, just a little tip. Otherwise, drink it the way you want to drink it. <laughs> so when it comes to smelling the 10 year olds, what, what are you guys picking up? What sort of aromas are you getting? See some things pop in the chat there. Citrus, minty, yeah. Uh, vanilla, varnish, <laughs> like it. Um, Nick, the whiskey, but want to know the house style. Uh, Northport is a good point. Yeah, Northport was our neighbor, uh, literally less than um, kind of half a mile away from us. Um, uh, unfortunately, one of the distilleries that closed, but our distillery manager from Van Caddam used to work at Northport. Um, he also claims it was haunted. Apparently, their warehouses uh, had uh, the ghost of an old exercise man that used to kind of haunt the um the warehouse and in the olden days they used to check casks with a bung hammer so not with a bung hammer sorry, but like a, a mallet that effectively you could hear the the level of the whiskey in the cask by tapping it and he said that on several occasions he'd lock up the warehouse at night and you'd hear like a tapping from inside the warehouse um personally i don't really believe in ghosts but it's a creepy story all the same but yeah it was kind of haunted by the old warehouseman but unfortunately now it's a supermarket car park the, as as the sad things come to be in, in whiskey the only thing that's left of Northport is like they left the, the gable wall as a, as a sort of um, display, but uh, unfortunately it's a long gone distillery, but nice whiskey though. Mm. Uh, Gerald, are you, I wasn't sure if you're speaking there, but I, I can't hear because your mic's muted, but I don't know if, if, if you're talking there. Um, Boo. <laughs> <Hey. Yes. laughs> oh, it's full yeah. of citrus and vanilla, and I love it. It's just a nice, light little. I'm not so much a peaty man, I'm more in this direction. Yeah, As opposed to Leon, who will drink absolutely anything. <laughs> He's my son, in case you don't know. I was going to say, if you just have pop shots with one of the guys, Leon, <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, so yeah, it was, it was uh, Gerald quickly. I saw him, him speaking there as well, but um, glad glad to hear it's gone down, Gerald. Um, sorry, the, oh, the two Geralds. Um, yeah. um, so don't Hello, worry, Gerald. Speaking. Um, but yeah, hopefully it should be a kind of nice, kind of fresh aperitif style whiskey. Um, <coughs> is, is um, Ernie, Ernie is my mate, is sitting opposite me, so we're comparing notes verbally as well as listening to you. Cool. Oh, that makes sense. That was it. Cool. <laughs> So you're talking, I wasn't sure if you were speaking to the camera, but um, good, I hope they're positive notes. <laughs> uh, but uh, joking aside, um, 
I say hopefully it's a nice kind of fresh style of whiskey. It's going to get your palate in, in the kind of in the whiskey tasting kind of zone, I suppose. Um, is it a kind of, a, I guess this is maybe your first jam of the day. I don't really know, don't want to imply. But for me, it's a great kind of a way to kind of enliven your palate. It's, it's got a really kind of fresh character to it. Um, and it's a really nice example of Glencarum spirit. So this is 10 years old. It's got depth, but it's very fresh as well. You're getting a lot of fresh fruit there. Um, and I always compare this to almost like a kind of Sauvignon Blanc or, or kind of like an unoaked Chardonnay of the wine world. It's got this brightness and this fruitiness, but almost an acidity. Um, not in the same way as you get from wine, but it has this kind of drying effect on the tongue. It kind of makes you salivate. It makes you want to have another dram. <laughs> um, so it's this really nice kind of fresh style. And I like it for two reasons. Firstly, it's a quite a unique style of whiskey. You don't really get that very often, that kind of brightness of fruit. Um, but it's, it's also a nice nod to the past. We haven't really changed anything in Dan Cadden. In fact, the only real thing we've modified in the distillery is we put in this magical thing called electricity about a year, uh, kind of about 100 years ago. But aside from that, it is this kind of old school style. They've not tried to modernize it. Um, and I said that, that bright fruit note that comes through, I think, is really, really interesting. Um, if you're into, if you like your food pairings, as you can probably tell, I do. Um, this is a really versatile whiskey as well. I think that whiskey sometimes gets left behind when it comes to pairing with foods. Um, and it's very much more kind of focused on the wine side of the, of the industry or the kind of the food and drinks world. But whiskeys can work really, really well with foods. So you just have to be careful to temper the alcohol. Um, and you always hear things like people pairing Isla whiskeys with oysters. Um, but actually, I think Glencadam 10 with oysters is even better than an Isla because smoky and salty doesn't really go with salty, in my opinion. It just gives you more salt. Um, whereas this gives you that crisp character. It gives you more fruit. And actually, if you pair that up with something kind of fresh and salty like oysters or smoked salmon, it works really, really well together. Um, so it's it kind of, it's a whiskey you can do. I'll try some more of the kind of ranges we get into it, but we'll have a good sniff. I will say Slange of Thank you very much for seeing me today. Uh, we'll have a little taste together, see what you think. Cheers. It's taken me a lot of willpower not to swallow that there. I said, I do apologize. Normally, I don't do the chef program thing and, uh, and don't taste what I'm talking about, but I literally have to drive in about an hour, so <laughs> I better not. <laughs> I always thought it was a nice and crisp like apple on it when, when I had this, particularly when it was in the glass for a while. It was always reminding me of just biting into a nice, sweet, fresh apple, you know, and that's where the freshness came from for me. It was always good that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I think there's a kind of, there's a nice kind of mix of a kind of fresh fruit, like you say, that kind of orchard fruits, apple kind of pear sort of um, thing. And there's a bit of kind of citrusiness there as well. It gives you this kind of, the, almost like an oil that you get from like a lemon pith or lemon peel. Um, yeah. And it really nicely. And then, I mean, obviously you're getting the impact of the, the bourbon cast there as well. So this is 100% bourbon cast matured. So you're going to get some kind of vanilla notes in there, some kind of creaminess coming in from those casks. Um, but for me, it's a nice little kind of signature of our style. It's a good hint to the whiskeys we're going to try throughout the tasting. Um, and Glen Caddam Spirit, like I said, is known for its fruitiness. Aside from that kind of historic nod to those fruity and spicy whiskies of the area, Glen Caddam is known for a really, really fruity spirit. And there's parts of our distillation that kind of form that, that I'll kind of talk about after we've had a couple of other drams to show you what it does. But, but effectively our new make spirit, the spirit that comes out of our distillation, um, smells like pineapple juice. It's really bright and tangy. Um, and I don't know if you remember that from the from the Stillhouse, uh, Craig, but or, or those of you that have visited, but it's got a really kind of heady tropical fruit kind of aroma to it. Um, mm -hmm. And that comes through our distillation, but it's, it's kind of the processes that lead to that. And you're going to taste that fruitiness that comes in a different form. Sometimes it's orchard fruits, apple fruits, um, kind of stone fruit, tropical fruit. But you're going to taste that kind of fruitiness in amongst all the jams we're going to try today. Um, one of them is port cast finished. It's going to be fruity for a different reason. But <laughs> um, but the spirit has this, this nice kind of, kind of telltale um, kind of signature to it, which I think is really good. There's a consistency within the range that kind of ties it back to being Glen Caddam um, time and time again. Now, we've tried the 10, and if you've got multiple glasses in front of you, do kind of keep a few out because it's a great way to compare across. Um, but I thought before I start telling you more about the distillery itself, we could try another dram just to give you a kind of balance of style. So our fruity spirit that we make at Glen Caddam really suits bourbon barrels. And you'll see that most of what we do is in bourbon casks. However, I was gonna show you Glen Caddam in an alternative cask now to show you what the spirit tastes like when it's put into different wood types. Um, so I thought the second dram we would do would be the Glen Caddam Reserve Andalusia. And that is a, 
a, a sherry finished style. So it's using more emphasis on Oloroso sherry butts from uh, Jerez in Spain. And I think it's quite nice to do it comparative to the 10 because I'm not saying one's better than the other. They're just different, but it gives you an idea of the spirit in a different cast type. Um, so that is this one here, quite a new release. Um, happy to see you guys got this in Australia because it's not been out for that long. Um, but the Reserve Andalusia comes in around the same sort of price point as the 10. Um, this one's NAS, so it's a non-age statement whiskey. Um, one assurance I can give you is that we're not a big uh, corporate whiskey company. Uh, the liquid in this bottle is not three years old. <laughs> I, can, I can confirm that with you. Um, so although it's non-age statement, it's not just a run-of-the-mill, kind of cheap as it comes kind of thing. This is a, a layering of whiskies between four to eight. Um, and they're using different casts that have been specially chosen for it. So it's not just a, a run-of-the-mill young whiskey. Um, and it's been pieced together using different parcels. So the whiskey in this um, is made up of some younger, fully matured um, sherry stock. So whiskey that spent its entire life in all of sherry. And then some older parcels that have been bourbon finished or bourbon matured first and then finished in Oloroso for 18 months to two years. And then we kind of piece them together to give this kind of rounder style of, of Glencadam. So it's going to give you a little bit of youthfulness from the spirit. It's going to give you some more dried fruits as well. Um, but I thought since we're trying the DNA style, we'll try an expression with some different finishes to give you guys that kind of that uh, counter position, both at the kind of entry level as well. Uh, Morella cherry is a fantastic taste though. I like that. So I'll pop up the bottom there. But yeah, if you give this a sniff, compared to the 10, the 10's very fresh. This one tastes more kind of confected. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative, but it's got that kind of uh, Bakewell tart, kind of um, Morello cherry, kind of cherry sweetness to it, or kind of like a baked goods kind of sweetness. A bit of Danish pastries maybe. But again, let me know what you guys are thinking when you're smelling this. See the other bits in the chat there. Spotted dick. Yeah, that's a good show, actually. <laughs> uh, Play Doh as well. Yeah, I know what you mean, actually. There is that kind of precious to it. Spotted dick, something you need to see your doctor about. But it's, uh, no, I know exactly what you mean. Funnily enough, my granddad, my other granddad, who is unfortunately no longer here. Um, loved um spotted dick as a pudding and spotted dick with custard reminds me of my childhood um i don't know it's one of these things that they probably should have renamed further down the line but it's a really good cake so it's hopefully i, I said the, the concept behind this was to talk talk you through the different finishes and i'm guessing as you guys are kind of a whiskey club you know the difference between sherry casks and bourbon casks do, do, anyone unfamiliar with with what i mean by sherry there's, there's not a problem if you are but i didn't want to kind of tell you how to suck eggs um but effectively, we're using wood from, from Andalusia in Spain, um, and it's been used to season Oloroso sherry in this case. And Oloroso sherry is a kind of full-bodied, but quite a dry sherry style. But when you use that for whiskey casks, that gives you this kind of sweetness. The, the notes that are typical of an Oloroso cask are things like toffee and dried fruits. Um, and they work really well for whiskey seasoning. Bourbon barrels tend to give you more vanilla and oils and butteriness. And, um, and sherry casks tend to give you more of that kind of dried fruit and that kind of, um, like I said, that kind of Christmas cakey um, kind of character. So we use it for, for flavor kind of modification, I suppose, in our whiskey. It gives us a different, a different flavor from our casks. Most of what we're going to try tonight is bourbon barrel, but I thought it'd be nice to show you the two differences at the beginning. And I think we'll probably finish on the 17 rather than the 21 because we'll taste it in terms of body rather than age, if that's cool. Because I think 17 is a nice kind of, a nice kind of juicy finisher. So we'll go for something big and a fruity at the end there. Um, but we'll just kind of show you a different number of casks throughout this. Out of interest, and I can, I'm only, again, I'm going to pick on the people who have the cameras on. Just from the nose so far, how would you say this compares to the 10 or the kind of the one we had to begin with? Would you say you prefer this style or do you prefer the 10 style? You nod for the 10? Yeah, 10. Can I have two? Yeah. <laughs> There tends to be a bigger preference on sherry cask in Australia, I think. I mean, that's really the way people go. But I certainly think with this distillery, you know, you've still got the vanilla coming out in the sherry barrel. You know, you've still got that kind of house style. But I yeah. think um, it, it suits that spirit of Glen Caddam, just bourbon barrel, like what I've always found myself, you know. So Definitely. I always think that we kind of, being the size of production we are, we kind of play to our strengths. And Glen Caddam spirit really works well in bourbon casks if we put it into a really heavy flavored cask like a sherry or a portwood it can sometimes kind of overpower the spirit um 
and don't get me wrong, I know that because so like the most popular styles of whiskey even here and, and kind of across the world are either big sherry whiskeys and heavily peated whiskeys. People kind of like to gravitate towards those styles. They tend to love them or hate them, but they tend to gravitate towards the big flavors. And Glen Cadam, although we do that, our spirit isn't a big flavored spirit. It's a very finessed spirit. There's a lot going on, but it's not a powerhouse. And I think that for that reason, we like to mature in a more gentle cast. So, so bourbon barrels really suit it. For this one and for the 17 that we'll try later, they are they're comprised of different things. So I said there's some stock in here that's uh, sherry finished. So it starts life in these bourbon barrels to give it some body. And then we put it into a stronger flavored cask. Um, but it's that kind of different pairing to it. But it's a nice alternative style. Um, I said we're, we're seeing a lot of carry through with this as well. As It's not a sherry bomb, which is a, a term that gets thrown around, but it is kind of a, a nice kind of sherry style. It's more of a kind of medium style sherry. So we'll say Slangeva, see what you guys think of the taste. Cheers. Brambly, yeah, absolutely. It's that kind of, for me, it's definitely that kind of berry fruits, dark berry fruits really come into it. Um, there's a nice kind of dried fruit note there as well, the kind of sultanas that I was talking about. It's kind of typical of that cast type. Um, but it's kind of sweet with a little bit of kind of a spritz at the end. And there's still a bit of spice there. You can tell it's a little bit younger. Um, and that's kind of nice. It's not just a big slick kind of sweet thing. It's, it's got a bit of body to it, a bit of vibrance. Um, but nice as an alternative to kind of show off the spirit in a different wood type. Overpowered by Sultanas. <laughs> Again, I, I, Daniel, I, I really do welcome your comments. I think that it's... Um, I don't want to sit and show you six whiskeys and kind of get everyone to say, oh, isn't this great? Yeah, it's great. It's, it's great to hear kind of genuine feedback. So I'm not offended if you, if you don't like any of the drams either. And if we all like the same thing, the industry would be a really boring place. So, so don't worry about that. Um, I don't know if overpowered by Sultanas is a good thing or a bad thing. I suppose it could be both, but, <laughs> but it's good to, um, I, say, I, I do kind of welcome the comments. It's so, um, just starting to show its flavor. Oops, it's here. A wall of alcohol. Decent finish. Yeah, I think the 46% on this does kind of, you do get that, that kind of spice in the spirit comes forward. Um, obviously, feel free to try it with a touch of water as well. I might kind of soften up some of the um, some of the alcohol kind of kick to it. Um, but I was kind of I was kind of puzzled as where to start with this distillery uh, sorry, this, uh, with this tasting because because the lineup we had was quite diverse. If I was doing it chronologically, we'd start in the Reserva Andalusia. But I thought to show you the ten first gives you an idea of what our core style is. So I think that that's where we'd start to kind of gravitate towards that in the beginning. But it it's sometimes a bit contradictory to do something kind of older than younger than, than older again. Um, but as I, I, thought, I thought we'd kind of do it in a kind of palette style rather than by, by age. But as I say, hopefully it's going down well so far. Hmm. I thought it was a good, good idea because um, the I noticed the Glencarum distillery has actually brought out over the past few years. Uh, so it was a 14 Oloroso sherry finish and then a 19. Yeah. And then they, they did a little bit of the 1825 sort of origins. And now they've went to this. It's sort of like they're just dabbling in this Oloroso sherry area, trying to find where the spirit sits perfectly, you know. And, uh, and I think they've done well. There's a good progression with that. I mean, the 14 was incredible. The 14 was a great dram, but obviously great things don't last forever. But um, it was uh, the, uh, but, you know, it's, it's starting to get back to that now. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I, I think um, it's one of these things that as a company, they're quite risk adverse. Angus and D, they kind of play to their strengths a lot. And although experimenting with different cast finishes is nothing new in the industry it's something that we've kind of been slower to react to because we know if we follow the the process that we've been doing it so in the same way we'll get a great spirit and i think trying to convince the owners to try something different that might not be quite what they want um is is always a bit of a battle and something that i've kind of taken on board and something i'm going to be doing a lot more of is different cask finishes um but with balance, I mean, we're not just going to do the editor thing and throw things everywhere. Um, I don't mean that in a negative, but some, some distillers literally kind of do every different type of cask and release it to let people try. For us, we're kind of, we're tempered with it. And I think that one of the great things about being a blending company as well is that we always have a use for something. So if there's casks that we have that don't quite fit the profile, we're not just going to release it because we can, we release it because we think it's good. Um, and if it doesn't fit, then we'll use it somewhere else. We've got other uses for it for casts that aren't really what we want to release into our range. Um, we actually have literally just released a cognac finish Glen Caddam, which works really well. Um, and it's something I've been harping on about since I joined the company uh, in 2015, because I think that the profile of Glen Caddam, if it works well in American Oak, 
things like a kind of French oak barrel are going to work well with it. It's not, cognac's not a really sweet finish, but it's got a really distinctive flavor. Um, so it's kind of playing to what works well with our spirit and it's turned out really, really well. It's a 14 year old cognac finish and it's literally just been released. Um, so one, one to keep an eye out for if you can. This one is younger. Um, it still gives you that, that fruitiness, but they wanted to keep that kind of spice in the Reserve Andalusia. Mainly just kind of, again, it's priced at a point that we wanted people to kind of use it as a step into the, the range as well. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's, it's the different, different finishes along the line. Um, but it is something that they are starting to look into more and see what else we can do with our spirits, but it's kind of a, a baby step situation. Um, we don't kind of throw it into anything too crazy. And obviously, with a production the size of what we have, we haven't got a lot of spirit to play with. We don't want to end up allocating a third of our stock to, to cast as an experiment. We want to kind of do it slowly and gently, but we're, we're kind of, yeah, there's some cool stuff down the pipeline as well. So um, to give you kind of a, a quick idea, uh, for those of you that haven't been to the distillery, um, it's, I think if people have been to a distillery before, do you understand how a whiskey distillery works roughly? Because um, I don't, again, I don't want to kind of tell you the obvious, but, but effectively, um, the distillery kind of follows the, the, the kind of the, the same path, I suppose, as most single malt distilleries. It has, uh, we take in our malted barley, we grind it up, we soak it in, in hot water. We then use the sugary liquids to ferment into alcohol and still it twice in our copper pot stills. But there's little parts of our distillation that really give you that flavor profile that you're starting to pick up. Um, and the kind of the main factors in this is our mash tun, which is where we extract the sugar from our liquids, uh, or the sugar from our barley. Uh, and then you have the fermentation process and the distillation. So firstly, I'll talk you through the mash, then we'll have a dram, talk you through fermentation, have a dram, and then talk you through distillation, if that sounds all right. I thought I'd kind of go through those stages. Um, but the distillery itself, it doesn't have its own uh, malt floor anymore. So we don't malt our own barley. Um, there are still a handful of distilleries in Scotland that do, um, but it's mainly for a kind of nod to the past. Most of these distilleries don't use it for most of their production. Um, it does look really good, it smells amazing, um, but turning malt by hand is, is a very labor intensive process for quite a low reward. Um, so nowadays it's more mechanized, malting is a very big industry. If you guys are into your beers and brewing as well, kind of malting is, is quite standard across the industry. And effectively what they do is they convert barley uh, to expose its sugars and kind of break down the kind of the starches in amongst it. So it, it makes it easier to use for fermentation to get the sugar out effectively. We then pass that through a mill in our distillery that grinds it up. Um, and the mill is a, what we call a Porteous Patent Mill. It's a big red box. Uh, if you've been to distilleries in Scotland, you've probably seen one before. Uh, and Porteous Patent Mills were made so well that the company literally went bust. They, they, kind of, they made them so well that no one bought another one and they folded. Uh, it was a real kind of sad success story. Um, the Porteous Mill at Glen Caddam is about 100 years old. The one at Tom and Tell is original um, to when we built the distillery in 1965. Um, and they just don't break. These things are amazing. Um, they're literally, they're really easy to fix. Um, so unfortunately, they were, they were too good, which is a phrase you don't really hear these days. Um, ironically, my iPhone dies every two years when my contract's about to run out. Um, so maybe they could take a leaf out of the Porteous book. Um, but in this mill, it's effective. We just grind it up into like an oatmeal that we call grist. And then we take this grist to extract our, our wort, our sugary liquid that we use to make whiskey. Um, our bash ton at Glen Caddam, those of you that have seen it will know what I mean. It's, a, it's, it's cast iron. Um, does anyone have a cast iron skillet or a cast iron cooking pan at home? Yeah? Someone want to tell me what's the great thing about cast iron? Even conduction of heat. Even conduction of heat, absolutely, yeah. Sorry, I was maybe a bit too long a linger there. Um, but yeah, iron's great, it holds heat really well. Um, and so it's fantastic for searing your steaks. But the negative to cast iron, aside from the fact it's a pain in the ass to clean, is also that it holds the heat really well. Um, so when we're doing our mash at Glencadden, we pump in hot water, and this helps extract the sugar from the, the grist from this barley oatmeal effectively. But then when we want to drain that away, the heat is absorbed into the sides of this mash tun, and it starts to bake. Um, so what happens is, is the heat from the tun kind of cooks the barley, uh, or not cooks it, but kind of solidifies the surface. And what that means is when you're draining away your wort, your sugary liquid, it has to kind of fight a little bit harder to get drained out because it's fighting its way through this kind of solid layer. Um, and it gives you this, this kind of um, very clear wort. So the sugars in this wort are very exposed. There's no particles or kind of husk that comes through this. Um, some people want a cloudy wort, some people want a clear wort. But what that means is when we take it to ferment, 
it's got a very, very violent fermentation. And I suppose I'll just cover fermentation here rather than jump back to it later. But, but effectively, so we take out our wort and after it's kind of an eight hour cycle of soaking this, um, we have this very exposed, um, very kind of clear wort. And when you add yeast to that to turn it into alcohol, the kind of the reaction is, is pretty violent and pretty instantaneous. So when you add the yeast, it foams up and foams over. And our washbacks are giant kind of fermentation vessels. They hold about 50,000 liters. Um, but you'll see at Glencadam, our washbacks are stainless steel, but they have wooden lids. Um, and the reason they have wooden lids is that we need to remove them every now and again, because it's not uncommon for them to pop off um, because of all the pressure and this fermentation can blow the lids off. So we have a kind of a very violent fermentation, which gives you a lot of ester development in our, in our um, fermentation. So our, our, our alcohol at this stage smells like what, what Craig was saying at the beginning, like kind of apples and pears. Um, kind of comes forward and bananas, this kind of sweetness from this kind of rapid fermentation. And that's just because of this old school mash tun. Total pain in the ass to clean. Uh, cleaning it is really, really warm work as well because obviously it's still really hot when you're in there scooping everything out. Um, but it does have an influence on our final spirit. Um, so this kind of this kind of very clear wort gives us this very fruity kind of starting that we get at Glencadam. So I just saw that uh, apples come from the yeast, not necessarily from the yeast, but further from fermentation. Yeah, um, that kind of the fruitiness esters that we talk about, which is like pear drops, if you remember those sweets. Um, that's that a lot of ester development happens in fermentation, but then after that, they're amplified in distillation. So I think a lot of people associate the fruit with copper and with the kind of the, the distillation part, but actually, what the distillation does is it kind of refines it further. So these fruity notes are there. And then when you put that through the stills, it kind of helps amplify that and brighten it up even more. Um, but the, the new, the, sorry, the wash, the, the kind of alcohol at this stage before it's distilled, uh, is very tasty. It's got this kind of soft wheat beer kind of flavor to it. It's like a kind of banana bread, honeyed sweetness. The only problem is it goes through you in about 20 minutes. Um, it's not very, uh, um, not very good for the guts. Um, and yeah, you, you can have a good mouthful of it if you're at the distillery, but you will need to find a bathroom. Um, but it's uh, a kind of a heavy kind of um, heady, um, at beer at this stage so we kind of we ferment it there for about 52 hours 54 hours that helps develop these kind of estuary notes develop this fruitiness in the spirit uh, and the, well sorry not in the spirit but in the liquid and we end up with a beer that's about eight percent abv at this stage so after this 54 hour fermentation eight percent abv and then we take that to distill however before we take it to distill we should have another dram so i think we should try the glencadam woo so i'm actually i'm a bit just kind of confused here of where we should go because if we do it by flavor we should do the 18 first or if you want something that's going to be more punchy and different to what you've just tried we should do the 15 first what do you think Greg I don't want to confuse people too much I I thought it would have went to the 15 um it was a just yep. a, I think it's more of a flavor progression to the 18 and 21 uh, yep. I could be wrong you probably had more Glen Carden than I've had <laughs> I was actually literally doing a Glen Carden tasting last night um but um, we'll do the 15. We'll do, it's, it's always hard to place them because we kind of have two inherent house styles. So aside from finishing, which we were kind of talking about briefly, Dan Cadam comes in, in two kind of formats. And although bourbon cask is really what we finesse in, that's what we kind of focus on with our spirit. There's kind of two formats of bourbon. So we go for the 10 year old style, which is that kind of more spirit forward, fresh, crisp, fruity. And, and they also have like a more wood forward style. So the, the 15 is much more focused on the cask, whereas the 10 and the 18 are more focused on the spirit. So 15 and 21 are more kind of punchy and wood forward. So it'll be quite nice to try going back actually. So we'll, we'll, we'll go for the 15 to begin with. Um, and the 15 year old Glen Cadam is probably our kind of cult classic. This is the one that if people know us, they tend to know the 15. Uh, it wins quite a lot of awards um, and it's a cracking dram in its own right. Um, my first major blending project at Angus Dundee was to recreate the 15, um, which was my favorite dram in the range too. Um, so quite kind of big shoes to fill. And the reason for that is um, the Glen Cadam Distillery before we bought it was, was, was closed for three years. So it used to be owned by a company called Allied de Mech Distillers. And Allied de Mech um, effectively became what's a lot of Pernod Ricard these days. It kind of devolved into in some other bigger companies. But when they did that, they left behind a couple of smaller distilleries and Glen Cadam was, was mothballed. So it was left dormant for three years. The reason I'm telling you that is there's a three year production gap that now affects us <laughs> due to that gap. So 2000 to 2003, there's no whiskey made at Glen Cadam. And the 15 was growing, growing good traction. It's the one that people know. Um, and then we got affected by this gap. So we had no 15 year old stock. Um, and um, so we had this, this three year gap 
Um, and when we had enough stock again, using our own liquid that we've distilled rather than what Allied had distilled, um, we had to to kind of recreate the spirit and make sure it was the same. And that was my first major task with Glen Cadam. They said, you need to make the 15 year old this time. Um, the good news is it's still very, very good. I've not, I've not tried to mess with it in any way at all. I've tried to make it in the same format as the original. It's this big, heady style of uh, bourbon cask maturation. I actually throw around the term bourbon bomb for this because it's never caught on, but I think that people talk about sherry bombs and big full-on flavors. This is a massive bourbon cask. <laughs> um, it's a really big flavor from these barrels and from a barrel that you don't normally expect a big flavor from. Um, so it's made in that style. The only thing that changed between this one and the original is there's a little hint of citrus at the back of this that wasn't there in the original 15. There's a kind of lemon oily kind of lemon pith at the back of the palate that you'll pick up in this um, that wasn't there in the original one. And I left that in there on purpose for two reasons. Number one, I'm using the stock that we had. That was kind of coming through with a lot of the whiskey we had. But actually, I think it enhances it a little bit further. It gives you this extra bit of dryness, this extra layer in amongst what's a very big whiskey. Um, so that's the only thing. So if you get a chance to try the old one and the new one, they should be very, very similar. When you give this one a nose, hopefully you'll find it's quite big. <laughs> um, if you have any 10 year old left in your glass, the 10 was very elegant. You could pick up quite a lot of what's in there. This one is a bit more kind of almost flat. It's a bit blunter on the nose because it's got a lot of kind of, a lot of texture, but actually it's harder to kind of pick out the little nuances I always find for this one. I'm seeing some comments pop up there. It was indeed Ralphie's best whiskey of 2016. Um, funnily enough, Ralphie voted it his best whiskey six months after we didn't have any stock. Um, so he voted it his, his whiskey of the year and we spent the next kind of six to eight months answering the phone to people wanting to buy it when we literally had none left. Um, uh, Ralphie's a lovely guy. Um, I, but as I say, it was one of these things, timing couldn't have been worse because literally, yeah, everybody's like, oh, we want to get the 15 and it's, yeah, it's been out of production for six months. Um, <laughs> Um, and by the time we brought it back out, I suppose his, his kind of whiskey of the year had died down a little bit, but I know he's still a big fan, so that's that's a good thing. But, um, I was also saying green apple there, yep, the initial scent is gone. It does, You gonna the fruit's going to come into the palate more than on the nose this time, so if someone's saying that, uh, it is a kind of flatter nose, not not that there's less going on, but it's just, there's a, it's a much heavier kind of aroma that comes out of it. It's a whiskey that if you leave for kind of 10, 20 minutes um, to breathe, you'll find that that kind of the thickness breaks down a little bit and you can pick up more of the fruit and more of the structure in there. Um, but hopefully you can smell it's quite sweet uh, and quite kind of quite big on the nose. I always found it was quite sea salt driven on the nose for some reason, I, every time I had it. You know? um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was, it, it was interesting though, was, uh, is that Doug's still at the distillery, isn't he? He's still the distiller there. Doug, um, was it brought out a uh, a sample of two two samples, one from the fridge and then just one from the cabinet. And he gave me a taste and said, uh, "Here's one sample. You, s you know, sell our whiskey in Australia. You would uh, you would know what these are." So pressure's on. Wife's looking at me. You know, uh, puts it in a glass. Oh, it's quite cold. I said. And uh, when when I when I had nosed etc., I didn't have much nose on it, but the palate was really nice. It was really fruity. It was actually probably more. Um, it was a, this uh, sort of berryness. So I tasted the other one and had a taste and straight away I said, oh, the one that's not cold, that's the 15 year old. Knew it straight away, knew what it was, quite happy with myself. I went back to the cold one again, couldn't get what it was at all. And I just said, you've actually stumped me. And he said, it's the 15 year old served at five degrees. Hmm. And it's just the same whiskey, but at a different temperature, he said. And it was a completely different whiskey. It was this like, blueberries and raspberries and all that sort of thing on the palate. And, that was amazing, you know? but yeah, incredible what it does. It's funny. So obviously there's a kind of, there's a big skepticism or a lot of kind of fern against things like ice and whiskey because it over dilutes it. But actually chilling your whiskey in a fridge is really, really interesting to do. Um, yeah. And again, Glen Cadam's really fun for, for chilling because of the kind of fruity component to it. So like the 10 year old works really well as well in the fridge. It kind of, it brings a kind of softer fruit notes like guava and kind of papaya and stuff. It's really cool that you don't taste when it's at kind of room temperature, but when you tone it back, it kind of, it brings up like a, a thick fruit so yeah you're saying that kind of blueberries and things that comes out of the 15 it's it's good fun to play around with mm -hmm. it goes very milky of course because it's non-chill filtered so it all goes kind of cloudy to look at but it's uh it kind of flattens out the tongue and you get different flavors to it which is cool um but yeah it's, it's a whiskey that i think this well i think this, this is the 18 is doug's favorite these days because i know he was always loving the 15 but um the 18 kind of ticks a box for him too but it is a, a kind of a big style of glencadam and a lot of people that know us know this style um so 
I'll, I'll say cheers. I've talk, probably talked about it a bit, but um, I hope you guys enjoy. I hope like the 15th. I was once told you should keep a whiskey in your mouth for one second for every year that it is old. Um, and that's a great idea in principle, but a really awkward thing to do if you're trying a 40 year old whiskey. However, trying to keep it in your mouth for about 10 seconds is really good practice and kind of coating over your cheeks and your tongue and your teeth. So it really gives you an idea of the kind of mouthfeel and that thickness of the spirit. But as for me, I, I just love the, the oiliness of this. It's a whiskey that you can really feel. Um, it's like a, a umami sort of character. You feel it kind of coat your cheeks and your teeth. It even tastes good at whatever time of the morning it is here. Or at 10 o'clock. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's got this, this lovely kind of thickness to it. And that comes through the cast that we use for this. This is using a huge amount of first fill bourbon barrels. Um, and when I throw around terms like that, these are just the bourbon casts that have been um, shipped straight from the States and used for scotch. So they're fresh use here in Scotland. We also use BB2s, which are second fill, third fills and refills. And the, the different filling of these casks give you different flavor components. So the first fill bourbons give you lots of that thick kind of vanilla custard, um, that kind of marzipan sweetness to it. Second fills are usually a nice balance between spirit and oak. Third fill tends to be more spirit driven and yada yada, they kind of change it down the line. But this one uses almost 60% first fill. It's this big, heavy um, kind of style of it. Um, and I like it, it's impactful. It's still got a fruitiness to it. Uh, there's no peat there at all, but it does have a kind of a, a thickness there. Um, and for me, I get this kind of almost like smoky kind of licorice note at the back as well. There's a kind of touch of, of kind of fennel or something kind of sweet smoky. Uh, very punchy. Yep. Like it. Softens and sweetens in the mouth. Yep. Um, seeing the lilt on the palate. Like it. Yeah. So there's going to be that bit of that bit of fruit time through there as well. How, how is this going down? Are you liking the 15 style? Yeah. It's, it's a funny one. Again, it's, it's very dependent on weather and situation and all this kind of thing, because for me, this is more of a winter whiskey. It's more of a kind of cold weather dram, whereas the 10 is very fresh. I could drink that any time of day. Um, and yeah, but it's, it's, it's the kind of the weight of it that I really enjoy. It's kind of, it's not what you'd maybe expect from a bourbon barrel whiskey in terms of it has this kind of intensity that you can you can push forward. And when I worked in whiskey retail before this job, um, I used to sell this to people that, that really like sherry casts, not because it tastes like a sherry cast, but actually like, like you said there, what's popular in, in Australia, Kind of people like sherry because sherry barrels tend to be big. They tend to be full flavored, big, rich whiskeys, and they're great. Don't, there's nothing wrong with them at all. Um, a good bit of mortlic on a good day, very hard to beat. But um, but I, I was always kind of saying to people, that look, kind of, although you can't get the dried fruits, um, the the kind of the thickness, that body, and that that richness can be delivered with a whiskey that uses bourbon the right way. And I used to use Lancanum 15 as an example to say, look, this isn't a sherry cask whiskey, but it's a whiskey that you might really appreciate in terms of body and richness. Um, it was a nice kind of uh, I think a contrast to what they might be familiar with, but a kind of stepping stone into a different style of whiskey um, to what they'd maybe normally buy. So it tended to work, but anyway. So hope that one's going down well. I've um, seen a few more things pop up in the comments. Sorry to keep jumping back and forth. Ten-year-old <laughs> weather in, in Melbourne. I'm sure it definitely is. <laughs> um, tastes good in warm climates too. I like it. Um, I say I'm very jealous. I wish I could see a bit more sunshine, but uh, we're working on it. Maybe Craig will invite me out sometime. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> if we're allowed to go anywhere, you're welcome. <laughs> you can be like the tennis players. You can come for two weeks and sit in a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to say, uh, even just leave Sterling District would be nice. But that's uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. It would be, be great to get back home as well. I'm sort of starting to miss family for the first time ever since moving here 25 years ago. I've uh, decided I'm, I'm starting to miss miss people now. And it's like, it's not a good feeling. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, um, was it, and, and getting getting some, I don't know if everybody's got the same problem, but obviously there's a lot of little releases that come out of uh, the UK. And if you travel, you tend to pick up some nice, you know, kind of distillery releases, et cetera. But at the moment, you know, you're relying on winning a ballot overseas online and then it gets shipped and when it gets shipped, it's a fortune to get it here. You know, you're paying three times the price to now get a little you know, fancy bottle of whiskey in from a distillery. And usually it's only 500 mils as well. So it's, uh, it's hard when you can't travel. <laughs> uh, that's a very good point. I was going to ask, where is home for you, Craig? Where, I was trying to place your accent, but where... Um... Originally from here. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. 
Yeah, not really, not now. <laughs> it's, yeah, there's it's a lot of history in here, but um, was it's not turned into that nice a town at the moment, but very, um, very, very history driven with Robert Burns and uh, you know, Isle of Arran facing it onto the Isle of Arran, etc. So, um, yeah, yeah, good for good for day trips. Yeah, Robbie's Drams is a cracking whiskey shop too. They got a good, uh, they got a good whiskey shop in there. But right, yeah, they do. Yeah, these times, like many places in Scotland, I think it's very aesthetically pretty, but they've kind of wrecked it a bit. But it's one of these things that, but that applies to most of the country, to be fair. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. That's true. Yeah, and my wife's from the Isle of Arran, so she's from Lumlash. So we tend to oh. when we go back home just uh, plot ourselves on Arran. And, yeah. Uh, but uh, my my in laws lived on Arran. And now they've moved uh, to next door to me in Australia. Really? So they live right there. So it's, it's almost like have you seen every, Everybody Loves Raymond? Mm -hmm. That show. That is what my life is like at the moment. Everybody loves Raymond. It's uh, but my parents don't live next door to me. It's her parents that live next door to us. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't be so fun. I, I, hopefully you have nice in-laws, but <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, you're welcome anytime. And same to you guys. I mean, I always say, and I, I mean it genuinely, kind of as, as a company, although we're developing a small visitor center at the moment, kind of we love to welcome people that know us. We are, be, being kind of the size of the company we are, we, we do all right with our blended stuff. Our single malts are still kind of a little bit harder to find, but we'd love to welcome you to come see us if you get a chance. If you're ever over in Scotland, which I know is a little bit of a trek for you guys, but if you are over in our neck of the woods, please give us a shout. We'd love to show you around. It tastes good here. Tastes even better in the warehouse, so do kind of keep in touch um, with drams, and hopefully we'll get a chance to have a dram together uh, at some point in the real life, whether it's in Australia or whether it's in Scotland. Um, but do kind of keep in touch uh, post tasting, because as I said, we do we'd love to keep in touch with you guys and, and see how you're getting on. So, um, we tried the Encounter 15. I think we should now try the 18 uh, beside it, because actually they're going to work really well as, as comparatives. Because what's fun with this? Um, also, for the people that are commenting, saying about it being more like ten-year-old weather. Um, this one is going to be more inclined to the 10 year old. Obviously it's eight years older than the 10 year old was, um, but it's got this really nice um, kind of hark back to that fruity spirit. So the 15 year old is very much cask focused. As I was saying, you're going to get more of that bourbon intensity. Going for the 18, this is a whiskey that's going to give you more of that Glencadam fruit that I was talking about. Now the fruit in Glencadam comes from a couple of things. Like I said, you're getting the ester development in the fermentation. But the real influence on our spirit is our stills. Uh, Glen Cadam stills are weird, <laughs> um, but in a really cool way. Um, in whiskey, if you visit a distillery, usually squat stills, like shorter stills, are a sign of bigger spirits. So Macallan, uh, Lagavulin, these kind of guys have short stills and they make heavy spirit, big wood uh, flavored, or kind of big kind of woody, earthy spirits. They are known for sherry casks for that reason, because heavier spirits tend to be a bit more sulfury. They tend to take on big flavors as well, like like a um, like a sherry butt. If you have big tall stills, they tend to be more lighter spirits. So Glen Morangy is very famous for its very tall stills. Uh, Tom and Tal has really tall stills, twenty three and a half feet, and these tend to give you kind of means your uh, vapors in the stills have to travel further. You get lighter spirit, more fruity, light, delicate spirit. Glen Cadam is weird because it's got small stills that work like tall stills, <laughs> uh, and the reason they do that is for a couple of things. Firstly, the distillery is two hundred years old. It wasn't that easy to make the roof a bit higher 200 years ago. Um, and they tried to develop this fruity style of spirit, but they did it with the, uh, with the space they had. So you've got this kind of short still, um, but it's got the line arm at the top of it, the kind of the arm that comes off of the still goes upwards rather than downwards. And I haven't got one to show you, but, but kind of roughly through interpretive dance, your whiskey still looks roughly like an onion. So you've got a kind of bulb at the bottom. You've got a kind of column that comes off the top and then there tends to be an arm that comes off like this. And what happens is the, the alcohol separates out from the liquid, rises up the still, condenses and cools in the arm and trickles back down as a, as a higher strength alcohol um, through every process of distillation. But because our arm goes up at 15 degrees, what happens is the vapors rise up and they reach the arm of the, the kind of still and they condense in the arm and fall back down again. And this causes uh, like a redistillation almost, it's called reflux. So what happens is the spirit gets lots and lots and lots of copper contact. And copper in, in whiskey, the reason we use copper stills is a good conductor, but it also, it helps remove sulfur from whiskey. It helps remove kind of volatile components, which would other give, otherwise give you kind of vegetal or kind of meaty character. So it gives you, it helps remove this because of this consistent reflux in the, the inclined line arms. That really finesses that fruity body of the spirit. So the Glencadam, because of this, and this happens in both stills, 
Um, that's where the, all the spree development comes from. And when I was saying about esters being amplified, it helps really turn those kind of those kind of apple pear aromas into like more of a kind of tropical fruit, more of a kind of um, bright, tangy fruit note. Um, so it's quite cool. So you get a whiskey that's got a bit of a body to it. So it's got a, a heavier body than say Tom and Tal, but loads and loads of fruit. <laughs> um, so this is kind of weird little still. And these are quite original. The only thing that's changed with the stills is they're no longer direct fired. Um, they used to have a big massive fire underneath them. Um, but the problem with that is when you add fire to alcohol, it doesn't end well. And actually there was two pretty serious distillery fires uh, back in the 19th, uh, kind of turn of the century. Um, and yeah, they give you this kind of, yeah, a, a few issues. So now they're internally heated with steam rather than with a big flame. But otherwise it's this kind of older style spirit. And I just sort of think, oh, okay, so yeah, it's the 18 year old we're going to try now. What's interesting with the 18 is if you see it, it's actually slightly lighter than the 15 in color. And that's because it uses less of these first fill barrels I was talking about. New barrels are going to give you more, more color um, from your, your casks. The 18 is a bit paler, but it doesn't lack in body. Uh, it's just got a different flavor to it. But when you smell this one comparative to the 15, you'll smell that the fruits are very much at the four again. They're not, um, the 15 is more kind of rich and, and full. This one's going to give you more of that elegant fruit note. I saw someone pop grapefruit into the chat. I definitely agree with that. For me, this one is like, we're kind of transitioning through the different um, different fruits, but this one's more like a kind of stone fruit. I get kind of this kind of peaches, apricot kind of sweetness to it. Maybe a bit of like green banana, but again, there's, a, there's no right and wrong notes to this. But for me, it's lovely and fresh. I, I think it's, it's really nice to see a spirit of that age with that fruity character that's it's 18 years old it's been in wood for for almost two decades and it's still got this really nice brightness in the nose the nose smells fresh um and i think that's really cool sometimes don't get me wrong kind of when you try the 21 it's very woody and very rich um but it's still got brightness to it but sometimes older whiskeys get very woody and a bit gnarly they can be very chewy um it's not a bad thing it's just a different profile but for me good spirit should last well in different cast types and as long as you've not put it in really bad wood if you can keep that brightness and that freshness inherent to our new make, I think that's really, really cool that you can get this, this kind of delicate and kind of elegant spirit, even though it's been sitting down for so long. Um, any other notes from you guys in the nose? What do you think about this one? Green apples? Yep. Yeah. Like it? Do you see the similarity between this and the 10? I think, as to say, it took me a while to get my head around that because obviously the, we like all our whiskeys for different reasons, but they do, they're kind of in tune with each other. The 18 is a relatively new addition to the range. Um, and because of that, when they brought it out, the 21 was well established as being quite full on and the 15 is quite full on. So that when they brought out the 18, they didn't want to bring out another whiskey that's the same as those two. Um, obviously different ages, but there's no point in making three whiskeys in the same ilk when they're that close together. So the idea was to give more of a, a kind of step back from the wood and more of a spirity style of, of Glen Canham 18 to show off what Glen Canham spirit can do. Um, so they kind of play quite nicely together, even though they're quite close in age. So give it a good sniff. Have a little dram of this one. See what you think. Uh, 18, very heavy 10. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's just a, a, a kind of heavier version. But, um, cheers. Let's see what you think of this one. Thanks. Mm. I don't know if it's just because of the time in the morning, but that's probably my favorite jam so far. I really like that. <laughs> that freshness is perfect for this time of the day. <laughs> it would make you drunkable. I like it. It is, it's, it is light. It's, it's a funny whiskey because so I've, I've done this before in tastings where I've started with the 18, because actually in terms of physical flavor, this is probably the lightest of the bunch. Um, the 10's got that spice that comes through with the, the kind of younger alcohol, whereas this one has got, has got lots of complexity. There's lots of layering in it, but it is quite delicate at the same time. It's a really nice balance of malt. Funnily enough, I always think this one tastes lower than the ABV it is as well. I think that it's 46, but actually it's got a very gentle mouthfeel to it. It doesn't really catch you in the throat it's more of a kind of light, light kind of tingle on your tongue um, but I love the kind of freshness to it I don't think so anyway
Um, definitely make me a drug sound in the mouth. It's like the soapy on the finish. Yep, yeah, reminds me of Oven, this old 90s. Funnily enough, so Northport was always known for that kind of style as well. Not kind of that. I don't know if soap's what I would describe as, but yeah, like someone said Play Doh earlier, that kind of uh, character to it. Uh, one of the highest rated whiskies in Jim Murray's Whiskey Bell. You're right. Yeah, this was uh, got a humongous rating from him. I can't, was it 98 or 97 and a half? I can't remember. But. Because, yeah, we did. Um, the, the 25 year old Glen Cannon got a really high rating from him as well. Uh, and I remember meeting him at uh, Whiskey Live Manila uh, over in the Philippines. And he was saying that. Oh, you know, your your twenty five year old almost got my whiskey of the year. Uh, that was, and I was like, why didn't it? <laughs> um, but uh, unfortunately, yeah, but we didn't pay him. But no, yeah, um, yes, definitely. Um, this one's got that lo lovely kind of uh, balance to it. I'm just trying to check where the, yeah. Um, but it was a very 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 high risk, ninety seven and a half. There we go. Um, but lovely, bright and fresh, and I think it's a good example of good spirit, kind of carefully matured. I think that. It's, as I said, there's no kind of off notes in it, really. There's lots of kind of freshness and crispness as well, but with that kind of soft um, kind of cake spice kind of sweetness to it that gives it with the age and the cask. You can't really achieve that in a, in a short space of time. That takes a long time to develop. Out of interest, who prefers, can you raise your hand if you prefer the 15 to the 18? Because I, I say that this always kind of splits an audience because some people really like that intensity where some people prefer the more kind of delicate character, but... Where would you see? Obviously, I'm not trying to rack them all up against each other. I'm just, just kind of curious on people's uh, palette styles. Yeah, 15 first. Cool. Do you like the 18 as well? Yeah, good. Oh, that's okay then. As long as they're all good, that's fine. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. 18 for you. Good. I said different whiskeys for different things. And it's, I think. Age is important in whiskey because it gives you an idea of what you're going to bring on. And I think that age statements are one of these things that, although Reserve Andalusia doesn't have an age statement, we're not going to start changing all of our whiskies to do that. Um, we value having age because it gives you an indicator of what's there. There's nothing wrong with the other option as well. Lots of people are stepping away from it. But it's, uh, I think that it gives you an idea of a development you're going to try. So, so you can't replicate age. You can replicate cast types. You can do different things. You can kind of finish things faster with different types of wood. You can do things like STR where you're exposing more of the oak to give it a faster finish. Um, but there's certain things you can't replicate. And if you and age a whiskey well and you're careful with your maturation and keep an eye on it, you can get a really beautiful spirit. Um, and I just saw a comment there, I think about the 25. Um, the 25 is more in style of the 18 and the 10. Um, so a very good question. So 15 and 21 are more similar. The 25 is more like the 18 and the 10. Um, it's got this really nice, um, again, the kind of fresh fruits to it, which is, again, really beautiful to see in something of that age as well, a quarter of a century old and still having kind of peaches and uh, pineapple. It's quite a nice thing to see. Uh, consistently scored six years, yeah. Because So, yeah, so um, Jim Murray literally had this, yeah, he has a real thing for Glen Caddam. Uh, we took him on board at the very beginning, uh, I think when they bought it in 2003, to have a little look to do some consulting. Consulting is not necessarily what it was. It was just looking at casks. Um, but uh, that's that's what he refers to in consulting. But he is a guy that kind of does have a lot of affinity for the whiskey. I think if we ever changed our uh, our whiskey to be more sherry forward, he probably wouldn't like it. And actually, to be honest, the 19-year-old uh, Glen Caddam is one of my favorites, which is six years finished in Oloroso, and he doesn't rate that one very high. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to take the other ones. Um, oh, that was the only one that you ever rated under 90, which yeah, is it interesting. Yeah. Because he doesn't like big, heavy sherry casks, but actually that one's not heavy. It's more of a kind of silky, milk chocolatey kind of sweetness to it. But yeah, he didn't like that one so much, um, which is, is quite consistent, I suppose. He doesn't really like sherry that much. But yeah. um, And the 10's just won, is that gold at the World Whiskey Awards this year? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. We actually So the, the 10 and the 15 pick up accolades regularly to the point that I literally, I, I struggle to keep on top of them. Um, and I say we have this funny little reputation in the industry. So although we're not that easy to find and lots of people don't know us, Glen Camden is really well recognized. And I think because it's quite an authentic spirit, and I mean that not from a, a marketing perspective, but even just for me to use in blending, Glen Camden is very hard to replicate. It's very hard to match to another whiskey. And even I was actually asking the group I had yesterday, and I opened it to you guys as well. If I was comparing this to something, I don't really know what to compare it to. Glen Camden 10 doesn't really taste like anything else. <laughs> um, 
it's got body that's more consistent with something maybe like a clean leash or a, an oven, but it doesn't have that flavor profile. It's just got that oiliness. It's got more of a flavor profile that's more bright. I've had Glenn Grant, like older Glenn Grant's used as a comparison before sometimes. Um, but it's it's quite a hard spirit to place in terms of people say, oh, what does it taste like? Um, and, and I think that that reason gives it a lot of carryover. It's, it's a distillery that when we reopened it in 2003, um, when we bought the distillery over, we got contacts from all over the whiskey world of people trying to buy Glen Callum spirit. Um, and the reason for that is in whiskey, you probably know that we do what we call reciprocal trading. So blenders trade cast with other distilleries. You can only, it's, it's like having a spice cabinet. If all you have is salt and pepper in your spice cabinet, you kind of need to get your hands on some oregano and some thyme and whatever else for your cooking. And it's kind of the same for blenders. So we have our two distilleries. So obviously we have a good supply of that. But to make a blend, we might need 20 different ingredients. So we trade with different distilleries to do that. And they do the same with us. But that fruitiness of Glen Cadham spirit in a blend, even if you only use 2% of it or 5% of it, makes a massive difference to the profile. So you'll find the older Glen Cadham creeps up in a lot of really premium blended whiskies. I can't tell you which ones, but you could probably guess. Um, because people want Glen Cadham spirit because it's a nice garnish. It's a kind of, it's an addition rather than a, you don't use it for your bulk malt. You want something more kind of generic and creamy and nutty for your bulk of malt if you're making a blend of whiskey. But using little portions of Glen Cadham can make a real difference. Um, and people kind of know that. And Angus Dundee were the first people to really make it a single malt because it's not, it's not a modern style of whiskey. It's an old school style of whiskey, but it's got a really distinctive flavor. And I think that they kind of recognize that that's, um, that's a nice thing to show and something a bit different. And people pick up awards for that, I think, as well. If I was being blunt about it rather than uh, romantic about it, I think if, having been on tasting panels myself, Glen Cannon stands out because it's not consistent. And if you try a bunch of different whiskeys um, in a row and the Glen Cannon and amongst it, it's probably going to be quite bright in the glass. So I think we people pick it out because it's quite interesting um, and it's quite different. All the, albeit not, not necessarily someone's direct taste profile, but it is something that kind of stands out because it's quite quite different tasting. So I suppose that goes in our favor, but so we'll try not to change that. <laughs> is that the, uh, you're talking about fermentation before, 54 hours is a very short fermentation. So it is. what would happen to it if it went longer? What's, what, what would you lose then? Um, you wouldn't lose, you'd, it would be a different spirit profile. So like Glen Allachy, I know that Billy Walker's doing a really long fermentation up at Glen Allachy now. He's changed it around to be about 120 hours or something. Um, your minimum fermentation times are usually about kind of after 40, so like 40, 45 mm -hmm. is, a, is a short fermentation. And then you kind of eke it out. And the longer you leave your, your ferment in there, you develop more things like lactone. So they, they actually go kind of sour um, is effectively the... The, the thing that happens over time and it gives you a, a different texture to your whiskey obviously when you distill that it doesn't come out tasting sour because that'd be gross but it's almost it's like what milk does if you leave it out it kind of it develops over time and gets a different texture to it um so if we were to do that it would give us probably a, an even thicker profile but it would probably detract from the fresh fruit so your ester components and things like that happen quite quickly especially in a fast fermentation it kind of these things start to generate really quickly as the as the yeast interacts with the sugar. So there's a there's a sweetness that's there inherently, and, and we try to preserve that as kind of a fresh sweetness. So that estuary style is what we look for for our distillation to give you that kind of tropical fruit spirit. If we left it longer, it would probably be more of a kind of like a baked kind of fruit sweetness to it rather than that tanginess. Um, it'd be fun to do. Again, I suppose for us, it's always a, a problem of, of supply. We, we don't have a lot of spirit to play with, really. Um, so I think that if we were to change it, we'd be sacrificing potential use for other things if it didn't work. Uh, Robert would love to play around with this. I was chatting to him yesterday about it actually, um, to do like longer fermentations just to see what it did. Um, but for us, we kind of have that desired profile that we're looking for. So that's the fermentation we use. Really, like you said earlier, the best thing for us to do would be buy another distillery and play around with theirs. We don't compromise what we're doing here, but uh, if only it was as simple. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's a funny one. So long fermentations versus short. It's a it's a stylistic thing by the distillers. Same with like wooden washbacks versus stainless steel. Um, wooden washbacks give you a slightly different flavor development. Um, they also give you a different temperature of ferment because you don't have to put the wort in at the same temperature. It kind of your temperatures are all controlled by how quickly your yeast reacts. So if it's a colder liquid, it takes longer for the yeast to kick in. If it goes too hot, the yeast dies. It's it's kind of it's balanced that. So for us, stainless steel and, and 54 works well for the flavor we're looking for. Um, but it always interesting to try. Uh, like I said at the beginning as well, any questions you guys have after this chat, uh, Craig has my email address. Um, feel free to 
shit around. Uh, as you can probably tell, I have no life. I literally I geek out on this stuff. Um, I, so if you wanted to talk things about fermentation or pH levels or any of this kind of stuff, I'd be very happy to talk about it. I just I don't want to bombard you with that kind of stuff in in a tasting, but. If you were interested in the in the more intricate guts kind of of the process, very very happy to kind of uh, discuss that with you guys as well. That includes all whiskey, by the way. Like I said, uh, I'm happy to kind of help myth bust and uh, and explain some stuff. If there's anything you're thinking, I don't really know how that works. Really happy to kind of discuss it with you guys, genuinely. So, um, so do keep me there as a tool if you want me to. I just call myself a tool on camera, but anyway, yeah, you keep me there. As... <laughs> um, but it's a funny one. So like. So yeah, in terms of long fermentations, you've got people like Glen Alecky, Springbank, obviously, they do quite a long one as well. I think this is about 90 hours. Um, so it's a, it's a comparative thing. It's a stylistic choice as well. Um, and again, it, it, a lot of it's down to trial and error or or kind of, um, yeah, just, just kind of heritage and, uh, and tradition as well. Some people really stick to really long fermentations as a, as a state of practice. Um, there's new distilling and uh, new distilleries now that have super short fermentations as well. They have like kind of speed ones effectively. Um, and again, I suppose it's just mechanization and, and kind of different tech to, to make these things happen in different spaces of time. But... Everybody going okay with the 18? Cool. So I'm, in, I'm a bit I'm confused on what to show you next, um, because I think if we try the 21, then we're trying the bourbon together and you're going to go from the 15 style to the 18 and back to the kind of 15 style. So I think that's probably what I'm inclined to go for. Because the 17 is very, very sweet. I think that it might overpower the 21. If you guys are good to do 21 first. Do 21 first? Yeah, let's go for it. Cool. I'm going to have to make space in one of my glasses. So, Glen Canon 21. I love this. The only reason I don't shout about this being my favorite whiskey is because I can't afford to drink it every day. <laughs> um, and, but what I love about Glen Canon 21 is it reminds me of why I really got into whiskey. Um, so, I've been drinking whiskey now, I'll say legally, for since I was 18. Um, but it's something that, although I really and realistically couldn't afford to drink it in my early 20s because it's too expensive to buy a good whiskey. But my dad and my granddad, really big whiskey fans, and they kind of always got, gave me kind of nice drams and malts when I caught up with them. My granddad bores ridiculous measures about that much. It's, it's kind of a Tam's dram is his, his nickname to it, but literally floats like a fistful. Um, but I remember trying really good whiskey with him, but not knowing what it was. And I remember saying, oh, this is a cracking dram. Try this. And... What I don't remember is what I was drinking because I wasn't paying attention to it back then. But I remember the flavors and the, and the feeling of like this kind of cozy, warming, rustic whiskey uh, of sitting drinking it in his living room. And I think that this whiskey reminds me of that. It's like an old school style of, of whiskey. It's got a kind of rustic feel to it. And, and when you drink it, it's going to feel like you're getting a hug from an old friend. It kind of warms you from the inside out. It's this really kind of old school style. Um, interestingly, this whiskey is 100% bourbon cast. But I guess I get asked all the time if this has sherry in it. Um, and the reason I think people ask that is because it's got this kind of toffee sweetness to it. It's got this, this richness that you'd maybe associate more with a sherry cast style than a, than a bourbon cast style, but it's 100% bourbon. Um, these flavors come from two things. Uh, firstly, the spirit, that fruity note in the spirit kind of caramelizes that a little bit over time. Um, so you're going to get the, the honey and the toffee there is going to come out from that aged spirit. But it's also these bourbon casks, the vanilla that you pick up in a bourbon barrel, which is generally your go-to tasting note. Bourbon cask whiskey, you're getting vanilla. But actually, the vanillins, which is a compound that gives it a really well-named compound, but uh, vanillins also kind of caramelize it over time. So they don't taste like vanilla anymore when they get past their kind of 20s. They start to change. They become more rounded and more kind of, more like, again, that kind of, hot, uh, kind of toffee, treacly kind of sweetness to it. So... It's got quite a rich and kind of sweet nose. But yeah, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a whiskey I really, really enjoy. <laughs> what are you guys picking up on the nose? Sorry, the chat has um, fallen off my screen there, but what, what are you guys picking up when you give the 21 a smell? Real tropical fruit. Yeah, I like it. There's a bit of kind of like cantaloupe melon and brown sugar in there. The, as I say, it's not... It's not a modern style, um, and, and I mean that in an endearing way, and not even trying to necessarily be different. It's just, for me, it smells like old school whiskey. It's got this kind of rustic smell. And if you've tried like old blends from the 70s, it's a good example. When they have that kind of slightly sad, saddle leather kind of uh, mustiness to them, this is what that reminds me of. It's like an older style of, of spirit. Sorry, I popped something there. Melon, pineapple, yep. 
<laughs> I like the, the 15 comment and then go for 18 when it starts to cool off. I like it. <laughs> but yeah, this is, for me, it's inviting. I don't know about you guys, but for me, that ticks all the right boxes. I love that smell. I think it's uh, the kind of thing I'd wear as aftershave if the police wouldn't pull you over for it. Um, but it's just the kind of, like I say, a mixture of kind of musk, leather, sweetness. There's, there's, a, there's a kind of richness there as well. And I said the only reason I'm not showing this one last is because I think the, the 17 will, the sweetness of the 17 will overpower this. So we'll go for, for the weight rather than age. Uh, green apples at the point reminiscent of green spot Irish whiskey. Yeah, that's a good chip. Yep. Funnily enough, I remember doing this tasting before and someone talking about apple skins, um, which um, I'd never really thought of before. It's not something I use the tasting note, but I kind of got what it meant. Um, got a 21 from the whiskey company. Oh, nice. Superb. <laughs> Good. Well, Ian, I hope it's this is ticking the right boxes for you then, if it's uh, a precursor from it coming to arrive. Uh, retail price for this. Um, I only know it in pounds. I don't know what it is in, in uh, dollars, but I'll let, I'll let Craig answer that one. I think it's probably better for... So it's two, 265 um, was it retail? And then the, I think you've all been sent a code for a discount of 10%. So I'll be taking 10% off that yep, at the moment. Mm. How are you finding it, Craig? I know you've probably tried it before, but... <laughs> I really like this one. I um, was a, I didn't drink a lot of this, like you said, because I felt it was expensive. But I sort of feeling that from this time last year to now, this is the price of a standard whiskey that's really good at the moment. Like you're, you're getting really good quality out of this. And, you know, people have sort of upped that spend now, it seems like, to that sort of thing, whether they're in whiskey clubs or not, or they're sharing it with someone else at the moment because uh, they're not going to bars, I'm not sure. But it certainly yeah. uh, sits in that now. You know, yeah, uh, it's, it's very enjoyable, you know. Uh, we did um, a couple of years back with... Uh, rare steakhouse in the city we did a a, a, a dinner glen Caron dinner and the 10 went really really well with like sage burnt butter you know mm -hmm. creamy sage burnt butter it was just like an incredible and with a chardonnay so the chardonnay the 10 and the sage burnt butter were just this combination and they put it on the menu and they still have it on the menu because they just love it they think the combination is great but the 21 as well they have um a real creamy sauce that they really like creamy sauce that they put with a, one of their steaks and they think that this just fits right in with it as well. And it always reminds me of that now when I, you know, it's just like it actually goes with red meat. It goes with it as long as it's nice and soft and well done. And there's just the right amount of seasoning there. And this just fits in so well. You know, it's, uh, it's such a nice whiskey. Yeah. Mm. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, 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 the 10 and Sage Burnt Butter sounds amazing, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it, is, it was incredible. It was just the combination of it was like just perfect that they, 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 they had it that night. The, the, old, the only really the chef had, Kind of put this together and uh when we all tried it it was like that's just amazing you know and uh, the girl who runs the restaurant was like that has to go on the menu it is the the combination of all three was superb i can't remember the wine try to remember the the, the name of the wine company that did it <laughs> so, yeah no, i was doing a tasting with this in san francisco actually where they did it was chili and maple cured pork belly and they had it like bites in a, in a bamboo beside the sand and it was again that because it's got quite a heavy character to it and there's a, a kind of sandalwoody kind of spiciness to it, it, it works really well with, with red meat um, yeah. and that kind of the style to it. But yeah, like something a bit heavy and weighty. Um, like you said, that, that all sounds great as well. Uh, as someone's asking what steakhouse is rare, is like a studio set for those? Um, yeah, rare, rare steakhouse in Melbourne. So they have got three places in Melbourne in the city. And uh, I think they've got uptown, downtown, midtown. It's the midtown one that actually has this in the menu. And uh, they do they do a Glen Caron tasting ca tasting class twice a year in there, but they do it with food matching and wine matching, so it's uh, yeah, everything sort of with Glen Caron. Then they do one uh, all twice a year with Tom and Till, and they do yep. food matching. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's a really good section to go to. The the chef works really hard at it, trying to get the uh, all the food, then particularly the wine and the food and the whiskey all trying to uh, oh, yeah. mix in and try to be be one together. So that's it's pretty good. Yeah. 
I think I'm, I'm having to warrant my trip more and more. I think I'm going to have to come through. <laughs> that sounds pretty right. good. <laughs> wait, wait till you come here. The food in the food in Australia is amazing. I'm, I was going to say Melbourne just because I live here, but the food in Australia is incredible, and the, the chefs here in this country do so well at just uh, taking what they've learned and trying to match up with some really good flavors. And they've got so many different like seafood, and like you said, you know, we, the oysters here, etc. And uh, and some of this, I always think yeah, it'd be really nice with them. Um, like nice uh, tiger prawns or something like that, you know, on a summer's day, etc. So yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That sounds pretty good to me. You're singing my language. I'm getting hungry now. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have you got porridge to look forward to. It's breakfast time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's not quite the same. <laughs> Nick, I'm sold. I'm, I'm, I'm like it. <laughs> Um, so guys, if you haven't had a sip of this one already, um, let's have a little dram of the 21. Slange of See what you think. I feel like I can't spit that. <laughs> so my granddad that was telling you about that was is kind of still really into his whiskeys. Um, I say it was never like super high end stuff. He's he's kind of kind of a modest guy from a fishing village in the east coast of Scotland, but but he always appreciated a good dram. I remember him always saying that the the, the best whiskies are ones that when you drink them, you feel them trickle down for, down to your toes and then come back up to warm your ears. Um, and this whiskey kind of does that. I can feel it in my chest. It's got like a kind of cozy character. It's not aggressive. It doesn't kind of bite, but it's just really well put together. Um, and I don't say that because I blended this one because I I haven't blended the twenty one. Um, so I can't say it's well put together just me, but. I just think the cast and the selection work really, really well together. And there's no harshness. There's no real off notes. It's just got this nice mixture of kind of cozy spices, sweetness, and a, and a kind of warming kind of rustic whiskey style, in my opinion, anyway. Um, but it might lack the punch of a sherry cask if you want an old sherry, but it doesn't have any peat, but it does have a kind of toasty, sweet, nutty, kind of warming glow, which for me kind of ticks all the boxes. But... Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Glazed pineapple, that's a cool idea. Yeah, I like it. Uh, Flinders Lane, winter college with a nip of whiskey. Well, yeah, that's, that's like it. Well, exactly. Uh, I think um, I, I do love a cheeky bit of, of whiskey in the porridge. Uh, I've not tried that particular place, of course, but um, yeah, it depends on what I'm doing. Working from home has its perks. Don't get me wrong, I'm not sozzle all the time, but um, but funnily enough, uh, yeah, it's, but whiskey in the porridge is good, and especially in the winter's morning. Interestingly enough, for an actual physical perspective, tasting whiskey you're best to be doing it earlier in the day um so your palate is most receptive about kind of 10 11 o'clock so i'm coming into prime whiskey tasting time and the only problem is if, if uh yeah if you do actually do that then you end up kind of knocking yourself out for the rest of the day and need a lot of coffee but um but your palate's most receptive when you when you start to wake up as as the day progresses it gets dulled over time so actually your your palate's best before lunch and usually that kind of yeah kind of uh, 10 11 a.m although obviously if you do that you have a problem but that's uh <laughs> um one of those random bits of science but um but when david, i'm tasting david was saying at the start he visited 16 distilleries in a week i started to sort of think to myself that's starting pretty early and finishing pretty late <laughs> <laughs> yeah 16 in a week is, is hard going i think um i remember doing isla in a couple of days and my palate burnout was ridiculous like i remember by day three I just wanted to, to, I just wanted to eat something really plain because um, my tongue was just ruined. <laughs> um, I almost felt like I had like a, yeah, a coating of sea salt on top of it. I, I mean, don't go wrong, it was lovely, but I, by the end of it, I was like, I just, yeah, I, I'm just burnt out. Like literally can't taste anymore. All the cast strengths that are pouring you out of the cast are like giving you new make in the morning. And like, oh, <laughs> it's, it's beautiful, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it takes its toll. Pre-dram before tasting, yeah. Well, Nick, funnily enough, like like you're saying about the uh, kind of a pre-dram concept, something I do, especially if I'm doing like an afternoon training session with a group or whatever, the, your first dram is always going to set your tongue alight. It's going to make you go, Whoa. Um, And often the first sip of whatever you have is not going to react that well with your mouth. You're not going to pick a lot up. It's going to feel aggressive or a bit volatile. So your first sip of whiskey whenever you start drinking is never going to be your best one. <laughs> um, so usually what I get people to do is have a quick sip first and then taste it again. Um, like kind of let it sit on your tongue for a bit, let your mouth adjust to the spirit and then have a sip again when you're ready for it. Um, so actually having a pre jam tasting is a good idea. Um, I think so anyway. <laughs> so 
if you still have some 21 in your glass, do keep it there because you can argue, we can, we can debate whether it was the right thing to do at this stage. Um, but the next one we're going to try in the last dram of tonight uh, or this morning um, is this guy here. And this is Glenn Callum, 17 year old Portwood. The reason I'm holding it up, not label side, is because this stuff is super dark. Um, natural color, uh, it looks like jam. Uh, it tastes like jam. You could literally spread this on your toast. Um, and actually probably the most breakfasty thing of everything I've got in front of me right now. Um, and this is a whiskey when we're talking about finishes, um, you'll see that kind of we, we do use a lot of bourbon cask. Bourbon cask is what suits us. We, we know that our spirit develops well in bourbon. Um, and what we do tend to do, like we were talking about with Craig earlier, is that if we're going to do a finish, we tend to put it into bourbon cask first to let that spirit get some body. If you take a light, fresh spirit, something nice, like light and fruity, fire it straight into a heavy bar like heavy flavored cask the cask kind of overtakes it and you lose a bit of that distillery character so what we've done for this release is we put it into bourbon cask for 12 years so it gets time to develop it gets time to kind of grow and become a bit more rugged and then we put it into ruby port wine barrels for five years now port pipes are massive i don't know if you've, if you've seen a port pipe before um they hold roughly between 600 to 750 liters they're really big long casks uh, they have big fat middles and really narrow edges, so they're a nightmare to roll. And if a distillery has port casks in their warehouse, you'll see them because they'll either be on the floor or on the roof. They're really hard to store. <laughs> um, so if you're ever walking through a distillery warehouse and want to be like, ah, I see you're using port casks <laughs> um, in amongst the group of people you're with, you're, they're really easy to identify. And um, the whiskey that comes out of a port cask can be very variable. And there's two major styles of port wine in the world. You get Ruby style and tawny style. There's other variations, but Ruby port is effectively matured for a short time in cask and a long time in bottle. Uh, these have things like vintage ports, LBVs. These are all Ruby styles. And then you get tawny port and tawny port is matured for a long time in cask and then put into bottle. So tawny ports tend to be very good value for money. So they tend to be um, kind of, you get 20 year old, 30 year old tawnies, which have been, um, kind of heavily uh, matured in cask and they have a very different flavor to them, more concentrated fruits. So when we use these for whiskey, um, we kind of, we leave it there um, and we use different types for different types of finishes. So ruby finishes are great for long whiskey finishes. Ruby casks give you bright fruits, but they also give you tannin and tannin helps keep it from being too sickly. Tannin keeps it in check. Tawny casks are great for short finishes because they're more sugary, more kind of concentrated. So, um, Tawny port tends to be um, more of that kind of heavy, thick sweetness. You only really want it in there for a short time. Ruby gives you a longer fix. So this one is using Ruby cask because we left it in there for the five years. Um, just in the comments, but through. Uh, pre down testing, yeah, I think could have left this four years and got the 21. <laughs> Sorry. I know, I, I don't know. Um, this is, a, I, I kind of figured that it was better to do it in terms of richness. So this one is quite sweet to finish. And if you try, the 21 after it, it can kind of make the 21 seem spicier. That was the only reason I did it, but I understand what you mean. <laughs> In the right order. <laughs> so yeah, this one, when you smell it though, so aside from the obvious color, uh, this one is, you're gonna smell much more kind of developed fruit there and, and not the same sort of fruits we picked up before. There's not really so much of the kind of tropical apple character. It's more red fruits and berry fruits, which is what you expect really from a port barrel. Uh, for me, there's quite a lot of spice in there too. You got kind of a clove spiciness. But what, what kind of things are you guys picking up? Yeah, coffee's a good one. Funnily enough, if I was if I was putting on my wanky tasting note voice, I would say like mocha. It's got a kind of uh, a kind of slightly sweetened coffee, so a bit, a bit of cocoa powder in there. But yeah, there's, it's a kind of, it's not a really sweet smell. It's more, you can definitely pick up the berry fruits, but there's a kind of a spice there that kind of keeps it from being too, too sweet. Honey's a good one as well. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Cocoa and coffee, yeah. As I say, it's, um, it's definitely quite rich. This is like a dessert whiskey is it's that sort of style works well with a cigar if you're into that kind of thing as well uh, i say uh, we've just released a cigar malt i'm still finding out the the pros and cons of what you can say about tobacco without seeming like you're forcing on people um but if you're into them great if you're not you're probably healthier than me so that's good um but uh cooked sugar top of creme brulee yeah i like that that's a good taste note <laughs> funny i'm looking back at the whiskey company notes and the person that did it and nothing that they've said i really get <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's quite different, the different in palate, you know, and the different nose people have. You're looking at it thinking, I don't get much of that at all. I'm getting more of what people are saying here. So it could be the just the way you're feeling or something like that, or it could just be different palettes because it's quite interesting. Yeah. It's a funny one. It's a situational thing. And, and we, I think because Angus and D, Glen Cadham is a kind of older style of brand, they've always been quite kind of flowery with the notes. You'll notice that, I don't know if you'll see them change over, but the new ones aren't like that. And I've started writing more of the notes than I ever used to do. We have a guy called Duncan who you've maybe met. Love the guy, old school kind of whiskey guy, he used to write more of the kind of traditional style tasting notes. And I think the problem with trying to do that is that you end up isolating people. And we've all been there with, where you pick up a bottle of wine and you're like, oh, that sounds quite good. Um, but then you get back and it doesn't taste anything like what the label says. And I think that it, for me, tasting notes are there to back things up. So you kind of want a reassurance of what you're after. And most of the notes I write start with something vague, like, oh, it's going to be sweet and spicy with notes of blah, 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 blah. And effectively, the headline is it's going to be sweet and spicy. The rest of it is what you're going to pick up. And I try to kind of keep it that way. Or I'm going to be like, oh, as complex and sweet and nutty or whatever else so that everyone's going to pick up that bit. But then after that, you can kind of go into the nuances more. Um, and yeah, it's, for me, it's a situational thing. This whiskey smells much brighter, much fruitier with a touch of water. So the port really jumps out the glass when you add water. When it's on its own, it's more rustic, more of that kind of coffee, dry, kind of toasted sugar thing. Um, and it's a whiskey that definitely changes over time. So maybe, I don't know, maybe how, Spencer wrote the notes for the, the whiskey tasting thing. Maybe they were trying it in a different situation or, or with a touch of water or something. <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Nick. Uh, absolutely. And I think tasting notes are one of the hardest things to associate with. Um, I think that you're right. So, so I, I, like in terms of the market, people gravitate towards peat and they gravitate towards sherry because you can describe them and you can associate with them. So if you're drinking a, a sherry whiskey, you can usually either tell by the color or by the smell, you're like, oh, this is a sherry malt. Bourbon's much harder because it's kind of a bit vaguer. Um, and something I do when I'm doing training with, with like bar staff and things like that, some customers, um, is talk about how to taste things like the finish because lots of people struggle to talk about the finish in a whiskey because kind of a lot of it's part of what you taste. And usually finishes on whiskey are, are one of these things that you don't really read into unless it says it's long and warming, you're like, oh, that'll do. Um, but most things in the finish of a whiskey tend to be like wood and dryness that kind of come back in again. So it tends to be things like oak or, or kind of coffee or dark chocolate and these kind of things. But sometimes it's hard to kind of allocate that with your mouth. But the thing is, at the end of the day, tasting notes are there as a guide. They're not there to kind of, hopefully, if you can't taste the bottle from looking at it through the glass, it gives you an idea of what you're going to drink. But you don't want it to be so polarizing. And I think that dark whiskeys seem more appealing on the eye, so people tend to go for it. So Sherry cast tick boxes for multiple reasons on, on that side as well. Um, and I think the nice thing, I suppose, with the Portwood is it's red. So people kind of get an idea that it's going to be, <laughs> um, it's going to associate with maybe something they already drink. But it is hard to get out of the box. And I think that, again, there's no right and wrong. And, and I've gone through lots of phases of being an absolute kind of sherry head. And that's all I wanted to drink. And then I kind of go off them and on them. And same with Pete. Um, it's just kind of varying between. And really, bourbon casts are great if you want to get into the real guts of a distillery, because it really shows you what the spirit is. Whereas sherry is a really nice way to show off a kind of a style of maturation. And some whiskeys work really, really well with that. Some don't. Some whiskeys work well in sherry and are terrible in bourbon casks, some of the other way around. Um, so it's, it's just kind of finding your grips. And I suppose it's the negative of the whiskey hobby that is expensive and not everybody can get a chance to buy a bottle to, to really get into things because they're expensive. You can't just buy yourself every dram you want to see. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm sure Craig would like it if you did. but uh, And you know who to talk to if you want to buy every bottle you can see. But it is one of these things that that's why whiskey bars are great and why tastings are great because it gives you a chance to try things you might not have had before. And then decide if you like it or not. Because like I said, I'm not expecting you all to love everything we do, but... It, I'd rather you tasted it here and I think every company would say this I'd rather you tasted it here and said that's not for me than you bought it and it became that dusty bottle that everyone has <laughs> the one that the friends come and be like oh this is great you're gonna love this you have this <laughs> um because you bought it on a whim and you don't like it um and yeah we no no company wants to be that bottle so I'd rather you tasted it and decided it's not for you but <laughs> those bottles are really hard to pass on as well to somebody else We've actually, we bought something at a whiskey show a few years back, pretty much bought it because I had too much to drink by the end and picked up the wrong bottle, bought it. And then um, we had it for three years, offering it to people, say, you can have it if you want, have a taste and you can have, you can just have it, just take the bottle with you. And it wasn't until last week we had somebody working here and said, do you want a bottle of whiskey? <laughs> Didn't let them taste it, just said, do you just want it? <laughs> 
<laughs> and off it went to a new home. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's going like yeah, they haunt you. I remember we had a we had a bottle. Funnily enough, so again, I know it's the biggest drink in Scotland, but um, famous grouse is not for me. Don't really like famous grouse very much. Um, and I remember winning a bottle in a, a raffle in fourth year of uni. And I took it to everyone's house party. So we tried to drink it with everything. I just don't like it very much. And um, literally took it to three or four different parties and left it at two of them. And they ended up coming back to parties hours and it appeared again. Like, oh, like we can't, can't get rid of this bottle. It just kind of floated around between us. Um, and there's a few drums that I've picked up. There's a few kind of random indie bottlings and things that I've picked up thinking that would be great. And they literally just sit. Um, the good news is you can always turn it into whiskey liqueur um, or, or <laughs> yeah, figure out a way to use it in a hot toddy. But... Uh, but yeah, I say nobody wants to be that dram. So no, no distilling company wants to be the one that sits in the back of your cabinet gathering dust. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, just getting a uh, very sweet catch to the back of the throat each sip. Yeah, it's got that kind of that, that tannic spice to it as well, like a like a full-bodied red wine. You're going to get that kind of tannic uh, pepperiness to it, but spearmint. Interesting, you picked that one up, Nick. Um, so land, random anecdote. I know I've waffled on a bit, but. Um, I remember speaking to Richard Patterson, who I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, in the whiskey world. And we were at a, a show in Vegas of all places, which again, told you it's a terrible job. But um, on the bus back to our, sort of taking the coach to the airplane, and I was standing beside him having a chat and he was asking uh, where I was working because I'd, I'd just left my other job to join Angus and D. And I was like, oh, Angus and D. And he's like, oh, Glen Cadham and Tom and Tal, good stuff. Uh, they used to own Tom and Tal once upon a time. And he's like, and Glen Cadham, you know, for me, it's a brilliant spirit. There's this lovely kind of spearmint note that runs through it. Um, and I remember thinking, I've never tasted spearmint in Glencadam. But I was kind of younger in the game at the time as well. And I was like, whoa, I don't, make, I must be doing something wrong. I mean, if Richard Patterson's picking up spearmint and I'm not, what am I doing? So I remember going back and tasting through the whole range and be like, I'm not getting spearmint. I don't know. I just can't find it. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's, it's a, a funny thing that's kind of run through. And I just personally, there's like a herbalness to some of them. But for me, I, I can't get spearmint. But other people pick it up and I'm like, crap, maybe my nose is broken. Because um, because if Richard Patterson gets it right, I <laughs> can't really argue with him. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, so there you go. You've got a nose as good as Richard Patterson. <laughs> uh, adding a few drops of water, um, I get again, green apple. Yeah, changes quite drastically from the top. It does. I, the water kind of opens up that sweetness to it, a fruitiness. Again, not necessarily uh, positive or negative, um, but different. Uh, running deep with me, warmer finish, agree with the apples after water. Yep. Uh, Richard, the Eagle Patterson. Oh, absolutely. Don't get me wrong. Like, uh, he's a fantastic showman, um, but I, I don't think he's the best blender in the industry, but he's, he's very good at doing what he does. And I mean that in a positive way. He's, he's really good. I, I remember speaking to a guy in the States who had, um, have you been to his tastings before with the whiskey flying around the place? Uh, he literally had to pick up the bill because he accidentally threw it in an air conditioning unit in a Marriott hotel when he was doing his tasting and like fried it. Um, so they, they had to I head up a bill for several thousand dollars but um, but he does a fantastic thing for the industry his book's really good I, I can't I can't really say negative things about him um, cracking moustache as well I've not quite worked on mine yet but uh, um, and he's very good friends with our master distiller so Robert Fleming uh, worked with him for for a long time um, so kind of a lot of Tom and Tao's flavor profiles were developed by by Richard Betts himself I, I can't argue with him too much So hopefully you're enjoying this dram. Uh, I know we've kind of talked about this one a bit, but since it's always nice to do a toast and although we can't clink glasses in person, uh, since this is the last dram, I was going to say slang of before I have a little taste, but thank you so much for your time uh, this evening slash this morning. And uh, and yeah, I hope we'll get a chance to maybe clink glasses in person, either on this side of the hemisphere or your side. But um, but I said, let, let's see what you think of this if you've not tried it already. And cheers. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Ian. It's uh, was it? Yeah, we'll definitely get you over here as soon as uh, as soon as we can. I'll we'll give you an invite at least. I'm sure lots of people will want that to happen and uh, share your expertise in the industry. But thanks for your time today. It's uh, been been wonderful. I think the 17 for me was the uh, the least favourite. Is the 17? I like bourbon cask whiskies. Uh, I'm I'm very old style. I I I'd go that way, and I I always enjoy the 10 and the 15. But uh, the 18 is definitely my favourite out of the range. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what everyone else thinks, but um, yeah, and it's 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 very hard to think to find a distillery that's basically maturing whiskey and not really making too many changes to it as it goes along to 21 years and then 25 years. Um, because well, most distilleries change it, they put they do a port, they do a sherry, they you know, and it's just so interchangeable. But something I did like was 
and I hope you saw a difference was like the green apple. You know, does, does, did that change throughout the years? Did it enhance the whiskey? Did it, what did it do to it? Because it's always there. And I quite like that, that it's always there because again, it's hardly seen now. People are trying to hide that new make spirit that they originally make and it tends to get lost with, with many distilleries now. I like how, I like distilleries that keep their essential, they're, they're enhancing the new make basically and then complementing it. So it's good to like, I like what Glenn Caddam's done with that, wonderful. Yeah, um, we've uh, we've also got uh, an announcement tonight that uh, a month today we'll be having Robert Fleming uh, do the exact same thing with Tom and Tow on the twenty fifth of March. So he'll be um, he, he'll be he'll be here, and we'll have six whiskies on offer from Tom and Tow, um, and we'll, um, well that will be on our website later on tonight. So in about an hour's time, that will go live, and uh, if you want to book into the Tom and Tow tasting, it will be there. Um, and uh, we're actually going to be tasting this one here. Have you tasted this one from? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Did you put this one together? Uh, <laughs> Robert with Robert, but yeah, so it's it's really really good. Genuinely, so I'm I'm pissed off though because they sold out of it so quickly that I couldn't get one. <laughs> so oh. I have I have like a 50 ml sample of it. I remember kind of yeah piecing it together with them, but it's it's really good. Um, Ten year finish Oloroso. It's yeah, bags of bags of fruit and spice. It's it's really really good. Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, nice and dark. So, but yeah, for uh, for you guys tasting like. Oh sorry. I, I haven't been drinking it. So uh, we've just filled all the taster bottles today from from this. Okay. Just got a few done. So uh, it'll be good to good to taste it and understand what it'll be like uh, in a month's time. But um, yeah, he'll be here. It'll be good to ask him because Robert's obviously been in the industry for many years, and it's good to understand some of these expertise in the industry. But. Uh, also been wonderful that Ian's been able to, to join us and share what he knows about Glen Caddam and what he's done in the industry as well. But thank you again. No problem. So genuinely not plugging him because he's in our company, but Robert is an amazing guy to get a chance to sit down with. So a lot of what I learned came from Robert. Um, he's been working in the industry, I think. Well, he's been working, he was on, brought up on Glenlivet Distillery. So he's literally been working it since he's about 12. Um, and he's, he's now in his 60s. But he's a uh, literal, yeah, he, what he doesn't know about whiskey isn't worth knowing. Um, so. If you, if you want to really get into the guts of, of the industry, Robert's an amazing guy to spend time with. So I'm, I'm sure it'll be an amazing tasting. I'm hoping that uh, we, we, yeah, we get into the, the guts of what he knows and uh, some, some stories as well, because he always seems to have them. And he, he seems to think that it's just his life and the stories don't mean anything. And for us, it's great to hear stuff like that, you know, and read books about it, et cetera. So well, for, for me anyway, I'm not sure about everyone else, but yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah, so it's, it's fantastic. But uh, does anybody else have any questions before we go? Don't want to leave anybody hanging. You can come off mute if you want and ask uh, Ian any question. Just um, check in the comments. Um. Right, everybody's happy. We have gone quite over time as well, um, but... Uh, I think uh, was it, we'll, we'll, we'll call it there as well. Um, it was that you do have a discount code. I think it's till to uh, sometime on Saturday that the discount code applies to buy some Glen Caddam if you're interested in any there. And uh, like I said, the Tom and Till tasting will go on in about an hour's time. Uh, feel free to, to add that one in. Uh, again, it will just be sent to you in little bottles. If you ever have any problems with the little bottles in the future, let us know. We're trying our hardest to find something that doesn't break or doesn't leak. Or <laughs> so we're uh, going to get these uh, up and running a little bit more often. But yeah, uh, but thank you and thanks again to you. Thanks everybody. Thanks so Craig, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So thank you. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Take care.